Hi, we're live at the Javits Center for the Nest Summit. Today we're talking about financial revolution and global waste management. And I'm joined by Stefan Niccolo from Full Cycle. Stefan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Jeff. So Stefan, we've had a lot of conversations this week and a lot of them have been around the fact that climate change is coming and we've got to kind of get out of the way of it. And a lot of companies talking about playing defense.
understand for, and for any investor. But playing offense means investing in those solutions and scaling them so that they become the infrastructure that we get to build that you sure. the United States, and it's about time that we're addressing a lot of these issues. How does that translate it to climate justice? Because a, a lot of people understand inherently what social justice is. Sure. Um, they might stand on the wrong side of it, but at least they understand what it is. Yeah. H- how do we correlate that to climate justice? I mean, there's a lot of links to, to both of those issues. And I say it very simply, justice is justice. And if we think about kind of where we have built what is taxing our climate uh, and, our, and our environment, most of that infrastructure is built in low-income neighborhoods or low-income neighborhoods were built around that infrastructure. So the statistic is that 70% of black and brown families in the United States live within 20 miles of a coal-fired, pl- a coal-fired power plant. All right, so small things about air quality uh, based on your proximity to a coal-fired plant have implications for health outcomes for children or for folks who need to get to work every day. And so what we think about building, where we build it, and most of all, in whose service we are building it, really matter. And this is about the choices that we've got to make uh, as a society. Do we want to build a fair and equitable society that is also sustainable, right? Or do we want to continue the status quo of kind of clustering folks who have little, little advocacy about where they can go elsewhere uh, around infrastructure that is no longer serving us anyway. So we've really got to make a choice here, and I think the two issues are intricately and inextricably related. Stefan, what do you see as the biggest gaps in achieving the climate goals that are so imperative to be reached? Um, and is there a connection to the work that you're doing around the SDGs? Do you use that in any way, the Sustainable Development Goals yeah. and targets of the UN in how you're measuring impact? Yeah, of course. I mean, what a... Um, What a great framework that the UN put together uh, a a few years ago to kind of really guide the markets to understand how we should be building forward. I think without it, you know, we would have a whole lot of the uh, do less harm still and not so much the ordered good. So I think it's been a really good framework. And for us, it's a guiding star because we can measure and understand our impact along these frames. Um, I think some of the challenges are Less so what we faced even three or four years ago, which was more climate denial and kind of challenging of the science. That's, you hear that a little bit less now. Um, I think more so it's about our political will Mm -hmm. and it's about capital. And those two things come together in super interesting ways. So for instance, are we gonna choose to establish and nurture a really robust market for green bonds and for debt instruments that are specific to financing the projects that are clean and green. Are we going to do that both as a country and is you know, the United States gonna play a role in the global environment in actually fostering this industry? Or are we gonna to continue to put those incentives and those instruments towards oil and gas and infrastructure that's no longer serving us in the way that it should? So these are about choices we've gotta make. Um, but I do think that's a challenge. And then I think the private sector really has to step in and say, hey, here's an opportunity for us to do well and do good. We should embrace it and pour capital into that, uh, into that space because it's gonna take trillions of dollars, right? And even full cycle, you know, we're oriented, we're raising a fund now, we're oriented towards building solutions out of our, out of our fund. But even if we raised the hundreds of billions of dollars necessary in the sectors where we've decided to focus, it's not enough. So we need every financial player to come in and really spur this market at scale to start building the things that can really help us. Do you see possibilities for new ways of raising capital or blended finance? Or what are the instruments that you're looking towards to solve this gap? I know uh, at the UN they say there's a two to five trillion dollar annual gap in meeting the sustainable development goals. And it's one of the reasons why the UN was really first recently open to embracing the public markets and working outside of the government and NGO world because they realized that there was no way there was enough capital within the government and NGO world to solve these problems. Is there a possibility of seeing this kind of blended finance model between NGO, government money, and private sector money? Absolutely. Um, You know, I think the idea that the same old instruments can achieve the results for a very new, very large problem isn't going to work. We're going to need to think about new ways of deploying capital, and that includes all of the instruments that we know, 
and ones that can be innovated at all the financial institutions that have a lot of wherewithal to do that. Um, so blended capital for sure plays a huge role. Um, I really do believe that every kind of institution, corporate, government, NGO, even consumers, play a role in what capital gets deployed and where, what solutions we invest in collectively because we decide they're for our public good. Um, you know, this is going to take some new thinking and, you know, we're happy to be on the forefront of it. You know, we invest in a dual, dual nature. So about 15, 20 percent of our portfolio is invested in growth equity. Pretty well known, pretty familiar to institutional investors. But 85, 80 to 85 percent of the portfolio is in infrastructure assets. And marrying those two gives us the ability to accelerate solutions, right? We grow the company by deploying more and more of their assets that are infrastructure assets. And so it's a small example, but it's one that really points to what can happen when you start to think a little bit outside of the box of, of traditional instruments and really have a goal of figuring out what needs to be solved, how best we solve that, and then working backwards towards the instruments that'll help us do that. Stefan, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Stefan's from Full Cycle, one of the rare companies out there that are trying to solve the climate problems in the world. You were live at the Nest Summit at the Javits Center. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I've been on a climate journey for the past six or seven years, and along the way, I've met a lot of really interesting people that have helped me understand what we're dealing with around climate change. No one has influenced me more in this six-year journey than Spencer Glendon. I had the great fortune of meeting Spencer about a year and a half, two years ago. He has dramatically changed how I view the world around climate change and climate risk, and I'm really incredibly excited for him to join us today to be able to share his wisdom with the rest of you. Spencer, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for the kind introduction. So, Spencer, when I read Sapiens, the book, and I started understanding that the Earth has really only had a stable climate for around the last 10,000 years, and that's what allowed us to create the civilizations that exist across the planet today, what I didn't understand at that time is that that stability was coming to an end. What is the issue with people really understanding how to grok an issue so big that has been so stable for the last 10 to 12,000 years? What is the difficulty of humans really accepting that that might be changing right now? So that's the important basis, I think, for understanding climate change at all, is that it's not that the climate has always been changing. It's that for 10,000 years, the climate didn't change. And during that time, we developed civilization. And civilization is a complex set of relationships, but all of it is based on the idea of stability, stability of location, that you can build and invest in things for the long term. And what I think happens is that the longer something is stable, the less you recognize it. The longer something is stable, the more you just assume it's the way it is. And I even look at how we talk about places like London is rainy. It's not that it's rainy now, it's that it implicitly always was and always will be. And we've come to this complacency that the earth is the way it's been since we were civilized. And what I want to point out to people is before that time, the earth was very unstable and humans as a result were nomads. If you didn't know where the nice places were going to be, you kept chasing them and you moved from one place to the other to avoid the ice or to avoid the raging heat. But we've been in place for so long that we think the, the limits of our imagination have shrunk and our assumption of what's given or what we take for granted have become further and further entrenched, including in things like what I, I think we'll probably talk about, financial models. So that is the big question. If the climate is becoming unstable, are the financial models that we're using today really adequate in assessing that risk? So the financial models we're using have two shortcomings in assessing that risk. The first is that they are all trained essentially on the last 75 years. Almost nobody uses financial models that are long, older than 50 years or uses data that goes back further than that. But certainly nobody uses data that goes back 12,000 years. And as a result, we're using models that were developed in a period of time that uh, is fundamentally unlike what's coming. So you have this problem that would be called out of sample problem, which is that everything that's coming from the climate, we've not seen before, but we have really fine models for what's come before. And this brings me to the second problem of the financial models is that long periods of stability lead to a use of precision. So what I tell people about climate change and their models is uh, that on the, in the first hand, there are missing variables. There's nowhere in a spreadsheet to assess the value of a company or a piece of real estate or the municipal bonds for something that is outside of the financial market. So there isn't anything about terrible storms. There isn't anything about exodus. There isn't anything about mass migration. The, the key variables are missing. And then the second part is they're, they've worked so hard to make their financial models be precise to two decimal places that it's hard for them to think in what I would call inframarginal or nonlinear changes. And if you look at the economics of climate change that are you know, the models of William Nordhaus and others, those models are actually incapable of producing nonlinear change. They take the past and say, well, the future will be like the recent past, just with some climate change. And as a result, all of our forecasts of the future, are pretty gradual, are pretty smooth, seem like they'd be pretty easy to adjust to. But that's because we've ruled out the possibility that they might not be. Spencer, you have this concept of edges. Can you describe to us what you mean by that and how that might disrupt the current models that we're looking at? Sure. So what I think about is that 
because we've lived in a stable environment for so long, we've maximized and optimized a lot of our infrastructure and the ways we live. So these consistent patterns are now embodied in the way we live. And those patterns have boundaries. Now, what I think about is that everywhere around the world, every piece of infrastructure, every person's job, every person's house or community has certain edges that are at risk of being crossed. Some of these are very hard for other people to see, but I think once you have this mindset, it's not that hard. So let's start with the easiest one, which is the coast of the ocean. It's clearly an edge that if you violate it, big problems happen, which is to say, if you assess where the ocean will be and it turns out to instead be in your living room or in the basement of your building or overwhelming your whole town, the crossing the edge from outside the ocean to inside the ocean is catastrophic. I think that's why there's so much attention on sea level rise. It's this easy to understand edge, but actually there are edges in all kinds of things. So you're in a nearly empty Manhattan, but all of the buildings in Manhattan are built with tolerances for how many days there will be above 90 degrees. And if it exceeds that, those buildings break down. Those buildings are literally not built for the right infrastructure. Neither is the entire grid. There are other things like the edges around agriculture. Many agricultural products need to have a hard frost in order to have a good yield the next year. If you lose those days below zero uh, centigrade or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the whole agricultural system changes. And so those edges exist in things like the grade of roads, the way the buildings are engineered. A big one that will be a big problem around the world is storm sewers. The so storm sewers are built with specific tolerances based on past data. And because warmer air holds much more moisture, for every one degree C warmer the air is, it holds 7% more moisture. It means that warmer air is going to give us bigger and bigger downpours. Well, those storm drains weren't built for the storms to come. And so that infrastructure will be overwhelmed. It may not mean that those places are unlivable. It means, though, that they have the wrong infrastructure and there will have to be a huge amount of spending just to fix back to some sort of stability for those places. And the longer climate change goes on, the further those edges keep moving. And that's what I want people to understand most is that we're when you think about this idea of keeping warming below one and a half or two degrees C, it's in hopes that you keep the edges from moving forever. Because if the edges are moving perpetually, eventually what the reaction is, is I'm not going to build anything long term. I'm not going to invest long term because the boundaries of what is coming keep moving. And so this is the last piece, I think, that's fundamental for uh, understanding the risks in finance of climate change is that I think duration will go away in the markets, which is the more people see change coming, the less long-term capital they'll be willing to offer. And so as we cross edges locally, nationally, internationally, we get to the last edge that nobody wants to talk about, but is the edges of nations and migration. And so most of the economics of climate change assume everybody stays put where they are and how to model what would happen if that changed is beyond the scope of, of most markets. When you say it's beyond the scope of most markets, are you saying that there's really a failure of imagination of human beings to comprehend or disassociate from the current stability that we've been dealing with? Yeah, I think that there is a, that you've used the right word, imagination. I think that there's a, there are kinds of risks that are easily quantifiable. And then there are some kinds of risks that are hard to quantify, but are still quantifiable. And if you look at how financial markets work, today in particular, if it can't be quantified, it's not considered a risk. It's left outside altogether. And that's the kind of risk that I worry most about, which is that the, the, the risk that yields are four and a half versus four, or that inflation is three versus two, those risks are well understood um, and thoroughly modeled. But the idea that there just won't be a 30-year mortgage somewhere, or that all of a sudden emerging markets financing will dry up for North Africa. The consequences of that are not likely to be small, but nobody knows how to put them into a spreadsheet. And I think the only way to do that is with a kind of a risk mindset that allows for the unquantifiable. There's a famous quote by uh, Charles Deming that is misquoted as, uh, you can only manage what you measure, but it leaves out that the most important things aren't measurable but actually you need to manage things you can't measure. And I feel like the financial markets have left alone things that can't be measured. 
and they are vulnerable to uh, changes in those assumptions and changes that come from outside. In that way, COVID is somewhat similar, which is that COVID, the, the reason people aren't going to work isn't because the price isn't right or the wage isn't right. It's something that's outside of financial markets has hit the system and nobody knows how to model it. When I saw you speak last year at the release of the Mackenzie Woods Hole papers, I heard you say something that I found incredibly interesting, especially for the capital markets assumptions. You said when everyone is asking when, when it's when, it's too late. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. So we went through a period of time uh, for the last many years when climate change was going to matter sometime in some degree. But we're now at a point along some of these edges, whether it's in Florida or whether it's in California or whether it's in uh, other parts of the world, Australia is a good example, where these edges are being breached and people can see it. They can see the proximity of the ocean or the proximity of the fires. And it's just a matter of whether they can eke out a few more years. So your uh, uh, memory comes from my talking about being on a, a radio program and in Florida. And before I even got on the air, the hostess was asking me when she should sell. And that wound up being the tone of the, of the call. They were ready for people to push back. And all really people wanted to know was how to get out and where to go when they get out. What's the problem with that is that you have, uh, we have a good history of this uh, economically, which is when a location becomes a place that people know they're going to leave. Once that market starts going down, it goes down catastrophically. Um, it's not clear who would move in and there's a race to get out. And that race may happen well before the swampiness hits wherever you live, but out of a sense that I need to be before the next person. And so this is a kind of transition risk that I worry a lot about, which is that it becomes disorderly very quickly. And one of the ways that can happen is that banks, in, in the case of Florida real estate or California real estate, is that either banks or insurance companies just decide this isn't a place to do business. We have a notion that partly comes from portfolio theory that people need to diversify everywhere. But I think there will be pockets of places where there just isn't any capital available because the prospective lenders will say, I don't know enough. There's too much uncertainty and they walk away. And we have evidence of that over the past hundred years in parts of the United States and parts of emerging markets. And every time that happens, the, the exodus is much faster than expected and the effect on prices is much more severe. Spencer, obviously we're dealing with a tremendous amount of risks. When we think about climate change, we're looking at extreme weather, extreme heat, floods, droughts, food scarcity, water scarcity, issues that the average person maybe doesn't even want to comprehend, um, let alone have the imagination, as you pointed out, to, to comprehend. What does the future look like to you around the capital markets and what are some significant changes that we can hope to see that might help this transition? Uh, so a couple of things. The first is that I think that we need to get to the point where the capital markets participants understand that they can't coordinate to solve this problem. The problem won't be solved by having more alpha and it also won't be solved by everybody going their own way. And if you have a long enough memory, you know this is true uh, from times in the past when there needed to be coordinated effort to save markets. Why? Because Markets rely on trust, rely on a sense of stability, rely on a set of norms, but it's impossible for the, the individual participants in the market to create those. And so I like to give the example of the last great Chicago fire, which was that uh, the last of the fires in the United States in particular, where cities went up and burned down. And the last great Chicago fire caused a reaction by the insurance industry, which says, until you regulate these buildings, until you regulate these cities, we're not providing any more capital. And that's how in the United States, we wound up with fire departments and building codes, that there needed to be discipline that came from within the market that required everybody to, to change the rules. And so it's the changes of rules that I think are most important. And what I think needs to happen is for the largest participants in the markets to clarify and ask for those rules. And I think the second part of it 
is this needs to be thought of not as a maximization or optimization problem, but as a risk problem. But the downside from slightly moving slightly faster is so much smaller than the downside from not moving at all. That the loss of capitalism altogether, the loss of real civility, I think is a great risk. And until you understand that, you're gonna fritter around about whether the right cost of carbon is $60 or $70. And I fully embrace the mindset that you should start with a high price of carbon. And if you just figure out that you're moving too fast, you can slow down. But this system has momentum. And if we keep moving marginally, 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 we'll be behind it the whole way as those larger risks grow. And so you need big institutions to ask for regulation and you need that regulation to be more aggressive than you might think, which can be scaled back later if need be. But the failure to act at all is, m and the problem of acting too fast isn't symmetric with the problem of acting too slowly. The problem of act acting too slowly is much, much more dire. So I'm hopeful that people like you and, the, and events like this can change that conversation to be just about from just about what are you doing to what are we doing and from worrying about whether your yield is four or three and a half to what do we do to save this system? And I think that's possible. Spencer, thank you so much for being with us at the Nest for Climate Week. I'm always inspired by listening to you and always learn something. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Hi, welcome back to the Javits Center and the Nest Summit. Today we have Ingmar Renshog joining us. And uh, I think the most important thing when we think about change and climate change is social networking sites. Uh, we look across the world at so many different things where social networking is affecting political scenarios or economic scenarios. So it makes perfect sense to me that we use social networking to wake up the world around climate issues. Amar, what was your inspiration in starting We Have No Time? My inspiration was actually Donald Trump uh, because he made me realize that there's no, there's no world leader that's going to solve the climate crisis for us. Uh, we must do it ourselves. We can't wait for, for a world leader to, to solve this crisis. So that's where I came up with this idea, how to create change really, really fast fr from, from the people. Uh, and uh, what I've seen is that social media has changed the world in just 10 years. We haven't had social media for that long. And it has changed the world for good and for bad. But it has changed it and has done it in a really, really short time period. So that was the idea behind the We Don't Have Time platform to create a social media platform that is solely focused on the climate and environmental crisis. And what you can do on our platform is get together with other people around the world and, and uh, communicate to the leaders, pressure them to act more and act faster. Uh, and by connecting everyone, that is a huge power and you can actually change it. So this was three years ago and now we're here. Amar, can you give us a sense of how fast things have grown and what do you have upcoming to really drive the message home for people that are, are still trying to understand the impact and effects of climate change and potentially what they can do about climate change. Uh, when you look back, uh, very, it had happened very much in, in one way, in another way it hasn't happened enough. Uh, but when we started, uh, and I started the We Don't Have Time organization, uh, the world was actually not talking about climate change as an emergency or a crisis. This was long before extinct rebellion, Greta Thunberg and everything. Uh, and uh, many people within sustainability thought that if they were speaking truth about this situation, they would scare people away. Uh, and uh, I think we have played one role to actually change that. Uh, and today, people are talking about the climate crisis as a crisis it is. So what the world has achieved in this two, three years period is that we have realized the problem, more and more leaders realize problems, but they still don't act. Uh, and as long as we don't act, it doesn't matter if we just realize the crisis. So where we need to go now is actually that every one of us that have realized the urgency about this crisis. We must use our voices. We must influence others to follow. That is the solution needed because we have this technology and we have the solution to actually solve the climate crisis, but we don't have the will of enough people to do it. Uh, and that's what we need to achieve. As I understand it, there's also an app that's attached to your social networking site that lets people vote about how they feel about a company regarding their impact around climate change. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, I believe that uh, we, may, we must have everyone on board on acting on the climate crisis and not just governments, but also businesses and organizations. And in order to help them, uh, to do more. We have created this tool where our users can identify and uh, communicate to them, but also to the world that they are doing something great. They can send climate love. Here is an organization and business that does something. Uh, look here, you can take after and do the same. But we also have the climate warning uh, and that's the opposite you can uh, give a climate warning to someone that is doing the wrong thing, something, something they need to stop doing. 
and the world will see that. And people don't like to be criticized of when the world looks on you. So, for instance, on our platform, one user gave the, the president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, a climate warning, and the embassy actually answered and got really concerned about the criticism. They haven't changed yet, but they answered. So, so leaders care about what people think if they are many enough. And on social media, you, it's really easy to uh, connect people and have them act together. And we have created a technology to do that, to give business organizations and also governments climate reviews, what they do good, what they do bad, and how they can improve their sustainability work. So as I understand it, you also hold events. Um, obviously, we're not holding live events these days, but you do hold events um, around your social media site that have had quite the impact. Can you tell us about ones that you've had in the past and what you have upcoming? Yes. Um, actually, long before Corona, uh, we did the, the world's first global no-fly climate conference. And it was, of course, 100% digitally, uh, and no one else did this back when. Uh, we were the first ones using Zoom, as we use now, for instance. Uh, and it was so efficient to reach out to people, to influence people about the climate. Uh, and the reason we do it is also, of course, because we don't, we have, it's very, very low emission from doing events digitally. Now it's kind of ironical because of the Corona crisis, everyone is doing those digital events and uh, that's actually good for the climate. So this year, uh, together with the Earth Day Network, we actually hosted the world's largest uh, global climate event, where we had over 100 speakers and 2 million viewers, uh, so where we collect people, leaders that do something to inspire others to follow and inspire us to action. And, uh, we also have a cooperation with the Climate Group and the New York City Climate Week. So on Thursday, September 24, we're going to host a digital conference called the Exponential Climate Action Summit, where we have invited leaders from businesses like Intel, Ericsson, IKEA, etc., to share how they are actually working with their climate um, uh, action and solutions and about a half the mission with just in within eight years. Uh, so we actually have created a trailer to show how we're doing those events and invite you to watch this sister event on the Climate Action Week that we can play right now, I think. Yes, definitely. Let's go to the trailer. I founded this organization. Uh, we're getting started. Not so much glacier left. Welcome to this online no-fly climate conference. And it starts on the ground level and it starts really small and then it just builds and builds. Our big banks are really bad for climate. You can make a big impact just by breaking that silence. We don't have the time to wait. We are only really recycling 1% fiber to fiber. Create a vision that is big and bold and beautiful. This is our city. This is our responsibility. Our goal is to connect people from all across the world through sports for climate. We overconsume stuff that we don't really need. The earth doesn't double at all, but the economic activity does. We don't just have a climate change threat to humanity. Neoclassical economics itself is an existential threat. It was the first time that the international scientific community had spoken with one voice and said, we're deep in the Anthropocene. We will basically be defining the contours of the new economy for decades to come. You are the people of the earth. Without land, you have nothing. We need to understand the system as a, in its entirety. The product has been produced already, and only these parts, which do not work anymore, are exchanged. Timber and wood is the only renewable building material that we have. The investors who have already understood what this is truly about are achieving incredible returns. We need different types of companies solving different issues, and we will do it together. 
with the customers. Our car will be only one piece of the puzzle. There is simply no reason not to invest in the green transition and take it a step upwards. We filter away the microplastics that are released from the clothes. The fuel we are using is uh, basically boiling water. There's basically a marketplace where the suppliers of these negative emissions can trade. No, we're not doing nearly enough to meet our Paris commitments. One of the things that Chevron, Chevron's predecessor company, Texaco, did wrong is they built about a thousand of these toxic waste pits. President Trump exemplifies the problem. He is a narcissist. He is a psychopath. You can set these things up, come up with policies to get there, and then if you're genuinely committed, bring about heroic change. We will never ever give up. Leaders around the world will take heed of our collective action, worry about it, and change their behavior. And if they don't, they will suffer the consequences. We need to connect everyone in the world. We need to connect them, we need to bring them online, we need to educate them, and we need to teach them how to learn. We need to inspire their curiosity and get them thinking and coming up with new solutions. And once they come with the ideas, we need to listen. We do have both the opportunity and the responsibility to intentionally choose the future that we want. Ingmar, that looks like a great event, and if people want to get involved, they have to go to We Don't Have Time, and you're on Facebook, Twitter, all social media sites, correct? Yeah, and our own platform. So you don't you have to use Facebook, Twitter anymore. You can just use we don't have time .org. And uh, we're, of course, operated by 100% renewable energy. And uh, we also plant a tree for all new users. So visit our site and uh, create an account in the we don't have time network and start the climate action today because we don't have time to wait. Ingmar, I know we don't have time, but could you leave us with any optimistic views that you've seen of late? Yes, definitely. Um, and this may sound a little strange to many people, I think. Uh, I actually had a conversation just before this, um, this event uh, with my colleague of mine, and he was so depressed because on the news, uh, on the normal television news, there were so many depressing uh, events about the climate crisis, the ice melting much faster when predicted, etc., etc., And actually, uh, I didn't agree with him that that was very, very worrisome. Because if you work with the climate field, you know that the climate crisis is worrisome. But what is great is that if the climate crisis is moving fast, so the humanity can see it and also report it on the news, we will act. Uh, because the humanity is very good at acting on a crisis they can see. Uh, so, of course, it's not good that the climate crisis is playing out. But what we have seen with the corona crisis is that if you see the crisis right in front of you, we will act. And actually, I think we're going to act on the climate crisis. And I think the time we have ahead of us as cons consumers, investors, citizens, etc., will be dramatically changing the whole world, changing the economy, changing the society. And it will not be for, for something bad. It will be better society building. But if you don't like change, you should be worried because we're going to change so much. And uh, just ride on that change. And if you do wise investment in the green future, you will be a winner and you will also contribute to save our planet and save the humanity. I want to thank Ingmar Rensog from We Don't Have Time for joining us at the Nest Summit. And good luck with your event, Ingmar.
I am Vince Molinari and welcome to the Nest Summit as part of Climate Week New York City. We truly have an all-star cast here today to talk about oceans, all that's going on in innovation and regeneration. Let me introduce them to you. Andy Sharpless, the CEO of Oceana.org. Leia Dioriel, founder of Oceanic Global. Sam Teicher, co-founder and chief reef officer, my favorite title ever, at Corovita, And Megan Riley Caton, co-founder of Oceans 2050. Welcome everybody. Delighted you can join. Uh, we talked a little bit about earlier in the virtual format, but really looking forward to, as we all engage further, how this digital transformation has really allowed us to get stories out in ways that we didn't realize we could before, and really to amplify those. So goal today is really for you all to share with us some of the great work that you're doing at your organization, some of the challenges. Um, where do we go next? How do we all help? And um, I want to start off with Andy. Andy, you know, Oceana has been doing amazing things for years. You've been driving that organization. Um, you know, I'd love if you can jump in and tell us uh, some of the great things about Oceana. Well, I, I thank you, Vince. We're, our job is to save the oceans, to help feed the world. And we do that by national policy change in key countries whose uh, oceans constitute the most, you know, the most valuable, the most productive parts of the world's oceans. Turns out that you can actually save the oceans kind of country by country if you go to the right places. Wow. And, and what have you been seeing as some of the bigger uh, challenges, concerns around the oceans today, Andy? There are three things, industrial scale overfishing, plastic, ocean plastic pollution, and then climate, climate change driven events that you know, relate to, especially to the oceans, uptake of CO2 from the atmosphere, which changes the chemistry of the ocean in a, in a deeply profound and destructive way. Thank you, Andy. We're going to come back to more of that and unbundle as we go along. I'd like to jump to Leia. Leia, uh, you know, you, you've, you've founded the organization. You've been moving forward. Tell us some of your thoughts of what you're doing. And, and same kind of question. You know, what, what are the concerns and, uh, that you see around the oceans? Yeah, so I think in relationship to Climate Week, I think one of the main things that we try and do is really looking at engaging your audiences around ocean conservation and looking at providing solutions at two levels. One is through individuals and communities. So this is much more around educational programming. And then the second one is really working with specific industries to shift operating practices. So this is through one of our programs called the Oceanic Standard. And here we really work with businesses such as hospitality, professional sports, um, music and entertainment to eliminate single-use plastics. And the way that we're really looking at talking about it this couple of week is actually looking at breaking down um, plastic pollution as a climate change solution. So, you know, when you're thinking about things like plastic, not only does one in eight barrels of oil actually go to making plastic, but also once um, the end of life cycle of plastic, when it enters the ocean and the methane, um, gas that actually comes out of that as well as when it goes to landfill um, as well as things around like waste management etc which is what we touch upon on through the oceanic standard program hey, maybe you can frame it up a little bit in size and scale you know we hear more and more about plastics the mm -hmm. impact um, plastic never goes away in the ocean as far as i understand right am i right it never completely goes away. It breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, and that's one of the things that we also touch upon is the human health factor of it. So there's definitely the environmental impact of plastic pollution, um, but also the fact that it accumulates up the food chain. You know, a lot of what Oceana does with um, seafood and ending up on, you know, with the fish that you eat, etc. But also looking at things like water quality. So actually in the US, 93% of water is contaminated with plastic, microplastics. So we're actually taking this into our bodies. So we really look at highlighting what is the environmental cost of it, but also touching upon uh, the human lens. Great. I'd love to jump to Sam next. Um, Sam, you know, I, I, I understand some of the great work that you're doing at Coral Vita. Love to learn more about it. And, and I think the first thing that jumped out at me was, growing coral, but wait, you're growing it on land. So uh, t tell us a little bit about that innovation. 
So we are integrating breakthrough methods developed by our advisors, other members of the scientific community to grow corals up to 50 times faster, which translates into months instead of decades, strengthen the resilience to threats like warming and acidifying oceans, and also increase their genetic diversity. And we're doing that through a commercial land-based coral farming model. So imagine just aquaculture on land. We have tanks, we take corals out from the ocean, uh, bring them to the farms on land, we're running nice clean seawater. It's almost like a spa treatment for them give them six, 12, 18 months to grow before we then plant them back out into degraded reefs to help bring them back to life. And this is a company that I started with my friend Gator Halpern in recognition of just how important reefs are. I mean, if you look at this one ecosystem, I've been a diver since I was a kid. I love the ocean, that's enough for me. But if you strip away the ecological wonder, they're really important for tourism and fisheries and coastal protection. There's a billion people around the world that depend on this one ecosystem alone, but they are dying. Uh, we've lost half the world's reefs and over 90% are on track to die within the next 30 years. So the best thing to do by far is to stop killing them. We need conservation measures put into place. We need to end pollution, habitat destruction, most importantly, solve climate change. But in recognition that a lot of those things aren't happening fast enough, what we're looking to do is create a whole industry around reef restoration and ecosystem restoration where all the stakeholders that depend on those values can purchase our more diverse and resilient corals restore reefs and that way we can help preserve them for future generations well and i think there's a huge vested interest maybe there's something in the neighborhood of a billion people on the globe that rely upon the oceans in one way shape or form or another yeah i mean if for coral reefs again this is not even talking about fisheries or mangroves or seagrass beds, but this one ecosystem, a quarter of all marine life uh, depends on coral reefs and they're found in over a hundred countries and territories. So when you think about food, clothes, shelter, how much people depend on this one ecosystem as they disappear, you have to wonder what's gonna happen to national economies, the impacts on food security, cultural heritage. So this is something that is not just a problem underwater that's out of sight, out of mind, it's happening right now and has tremendous impacts both on wildlife and incredible biodiversity, but also our ability as sort of humanity and society to, to survive and thrive. And so that's why at Coral Vita, we're really working to grow corals at a large scale and put them back out into greater reefs around the world. Wonderful. Megan, I'd love you to jump in. Um, your historic background, is, as far as I, I understand, has really been financial markets, investment banking, Infrastructure, infrastructure on land. You, you, you've now made this transition to the oceans, uh, 2050. What's going on and why, why that flip? Why that move for you? Sure. Uh, so I do have a background in finance. I got into finance, honestly, to, to try to make my projects work. I was a project developer um, and still, still am at heart. Um, but I've always been focused on climate solutions and through uh, relationship with Alexander Cousteau by learning about the issue, the impact of climate change on the oceans and also the potential for oceans uh, to provide real solutions to climate change and in a ways that are restorative both to the oceans and to the climate. Um, and that's what I got, why I got involved in Oceans 2050. Oceans 2050 is a campaign uh, created by Alexander Cousteau, who I gather you had on the show earlier today to focus on the restoration of abundance to the oceans by 2050. Um, we want to elevate our collective ambition to do more than just stem the losses and envision a world in which uh, there is an ocean that, for example, her grandfather would recognize. And we believe it's possible. Um, we are advised by leaders in the scientific community, uh, but there's so much that needs to be done. And some of the my colleagues on this panel have, have articulated a lot of it. Um, what our core strategy uh, to start in terms of focusing on solutions that are restorative to the oceans and the climate and that are scalable is scaling up seaweed aquaculture. Seaweed uh, farming, seaweed growing seaweed both in kelp forests and in farms is fundamentally restorative to the oceans and the climate. Uh, it also provides, de it oxygenates the water, helps to reverse dead zones and deacidification of the ocean. Um, provides habitat for baby fish and promotes biodiversity, provides coastal resilience, which is deeply important, um, and provides really good quality blue economy jobs with minimal barriers to entry, um, in addition to tax revenue and others, and helps to support fisheries. Uh, we also believe it's fundamental to helping to feed the world in 2050. Um, Andy knows a lot more about than that, that than I do with Oceana's 
campaign, which has had a lot of success around global fisheries, we think seaweed aquaculture is a fundamental part of the solution. What we bring to the table is both uh, Alexandra's voice um, and our ability to really be out there as uh, at the forefront of advocating for really regenerative, restorative solutions uh, on multiple levels. And also world-class science, our chief scientific advisor is the world expert on macroalgae and carbon. And we're running a project um, right now, a primary research project that we hope will demonstrate con convincingly the sequestration uh, of carbon in sediment by macroalgae and help to support monetizing those carbon economics for seaweed farmers, uh, expanding the social license for seaweed farming and helping to scale up seaweed farming around the world. I want to come back to more of that in a moment, Megan. Uh, but I want to jump back over to Andy. You brought Andy into uh, a bit of the conversation. It seems there's lots of collaboration going on between organizations. Andy, I, I believe Oceana is the, the most focused NGO on uh, preservation and regeneration of the oceans or, or close to it. Um, you have so many different initiatives that you've focused on. What's been the most effective? What, what do you pride yourself on as Oceana? Well, you're asking me to choose which of my children I like best. Is that what you want, Vince? Well, I, uh, you know, at least give them all a little bit of love. But you know, give, give, me, <laughs> give, give me the who's been the best behavior. Well, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, first of all, there's th this is a great panel, and, and the work that's being done by everybody on this panel is is necessary and essential. And um, it's very hard to choose just one thing. The thing that I'm, if I do though, the thing that I am most proud about at Oceana is um, when we've been able to achieve national policy change in big countries that have a big important piece of the ocean that they control that requires rebuilding as, as Megan was saying that requires as a matter of national policy that when they've depleted or overfished they must fix it and not just stop making it worse but rebuild to abundance as Megan says. One of the great things about ocean conservation is that the fish will come back remarkably quickly uh, this is a really robust and abundant and fertile part of nature and you don't have to wait 100 years um, to see results um, and so that's been my you know most satisfying um, you know my team's work again you know, always with allies always in partnership the american ocean is is better off now than it was um, 10 years ago in very measurable ways even part important parts of the european ocean are better off than they were uh, 10 years ago. So this is this is a situation where turnarounds do happen, they can happen, and you can measure them in the water. So people shouldn't get discouraged. Uh, and, and I love that part, Andy. You know, we, we talk about the challenges, we talk about the problems, especially this this panel and many others are creating solutions. They're making a difference. They're, they're, they're moving that level uh, to an actionable result. And, I, and I, I love when you talk about the impact that you've had on policy, right? What's been occurring. If you talk about the benefit uh, for the moment of why U.S. oceans, and perhaps to some degree, as you referenced, the European oceans are better today than they were 10 years ago, what do you attribute to that to? What, what could we amplify within that? Well, it sounds like a basic thing. Science-driven policy making, make policy rooted in the facts, stop overfishing, protect key nursery habitat, protect the reefs, um, and implement it. I mean, you know, enforce the law. Um, and then measure results so you can go back to your policymakers and to your citizenry and show, look, when you have a sensible science-driven policy that stops overfishing, that protects key habitat, look at what you get. You get more fish, you get more jobs, you get more food. And then you get a huge benefit for climate change, which we ought to come back to make sure everybody talks about. I mean, everybody on this panel will enthusiastically talk about the connections between a rebuilding ocean abundance and dealing with climate change. And, and I hope we'll come to that, Vince. Well, I'm going to come back to you on that. And you're going to tee that off for us in a minute, uh, Andy. I, I'd love to jump back to Sam for a second. Sam, you know, you, you are um, the, the entrepreneur. Uh, you, you're building from ground up, uh, you're, no pun intended, uh, you, you, and you're building from what, what was a dream, I guess, a vision for, born from your passion, your passion to make a difference back to those billion people that could be impacted. It's never easy. 
tell us about some of the trials, tribulations, the difficulties, and really a testimony to you and the team that you continue to come out the other side of those challenges. Well, I can tell you that I did not grow up dreaming of being a coral farmer as much as I love the ocean. I didn't even imagine myself becoming an entrepreneur, but it's something that my co-founder Gator and I sort of found ourselves in while we were in grad school, looking at these big environmental challenges and recognizing that some of them weren't being addressed at the pace and scale needed by government, uh, by policy, by NGOs, by academia. There needed to perhaps be a business solution that could come in uh, to work together with all those various communities to really scale things up. And so that was what led to Coral Vita even emerging as a company. Um, I'm definitely in an also interesting position to be an entrepreneur where I hope my company gets put out of business. I, I don't want to have to restore. I love that planned ob I, obsolescence. Yeah, you know, I, I, I hope to live in a world where reefs are fine. Um, unfortunately, we're not heading in that direction. And as you were sort of alluding to, uh, it's a company I started while I was in grad school, and we've gone through our fair share of uh, bumps, as is the case with many startups, but we have really experienced uh, the past year in particular a number of heavy ones. So we launched our first farm in Freeport, Grand Bahama in May of 2019, partnered with the Grand Bahama Port Authority, got support from the government of the Bahamas, working with local communities is a big part of our model. So really had an exciting summer growing 24 native species of coral. Most Caribbean projects go three to five. Uh, corals make babies after the full moon. That's a whole other conversation, but basically it takes about a million eggs to produce one adult coral typically. We got that ratio down to around 100 to one. Uh, we were negotiating restoration contracts and having our farm be a, a popular new tourism destination on the island and then Hurricane Dorian arrived. Uh, we just had the one year anniversary of that and it was the strongest storm ever hit the Bahamas. One of the strongest recorded storms in Atlantic history, uh, 225 mile an hour winds. At our farm, an 18 foot storm surge. That was almost triple the 100 year flood event. So we were knocked out of commission to say the least. We spent all of the fall doing humanitarian work for the local community, um, then started rebuilding our farm. And uh, two things happened. One is that the the time after the hurricane brought this disease that unfortunately has been spreading around the Caribbean and Florida since 2014, so pandemic under the sea as well. Um, coral diseases have been around for several decades, but this one is awful. It's called stony coral tissue loss disease, and half of species effectively in the Caribbean are affected, and once the coral is infected, something that took centuries to grow can be dead within weeks, so it's almost like a wildfire under the sea. Um, so we've been losing the corals even more rapidly since Dorian, and then we opened our doors, rebuilt the farm in March, just in time for the pandemic. Um, so that definitely has forced us to completely adapt. We were, got exemption from the government to keep operating. And in our mind, after the, the storm and even through the pandemic, the importance of our work and the importance of protecting nature around the world is even more clear because if you strip away everything else, we saw mangroves and coral reefs save people's lives during Hurricane Dorian. They slowed down the storm surge. When you've got island nations cut off from supply chains during something like the pandemic, you're able to promote local food security uh, and then also creating local jobs. Well, then thinking about the, the tourism industry is going to have to come back in a different way. Can we build nature based and eco friendly tourism in such a way that these reefs being healthier can help the economies and these nations recover? So we're still on our mission. We're actually in the process of uh, raising a $2 million round to expand our facility in Grand Bahama to the largest coral farm in the world. Um, and then we still want to do this work globally and work with organizations like everyone in this panel because ultimately it's a team effort and these crises are going to keep happening. Um, it's not going to get easier, but that doesn't mean we can't and should stop doing the work. It only reinforces the need to do it better and more, more rapidly. Thank you for your commitment and, and tenacity on that, Sam. Um, I want to jump to Megan. Uh, Megan, um, tell us a bit more. You know, you're, you're innovating, and I know uh, you're so excited about seaweed giant sea kelp, the impact. Give us a bit more about the approach. What, what do you think the outcomes are going to be as a result of that, and how do you get there? Well, I'm so excited to hear more about Coral Vita's work, which I've admired from afar, and I think we're all very aligned. And, you know, as Andy said, in the importance of restoration, regeneration, keeping some of these ecosystems on life support while we address the, the climate crisis, which is really at the root of the ocean crisis, um, and vice versa, to be frank. 
So seaweed's just one of our, of Ocean's 2050's approaches. Um, we are, we're part campaign in terms of trying to elevate people's ambition. Um, one of the things that's been frustrated, that, that founded, one of the, in, the ideas that founded Ocean's 2050 was this appreciation that a lot of people think there's no hope. Um, if you survey them, a lot of people think that the kind of doomsday scenarios for the ocean in 2050, you know, more plastic than fish, you know, more coral reefs, have actually already happened. And that's not the case. Um, we've lost about 50% of our blue natural capital and we've got about 10 years to try to save the rest. This is a really crucial decade for so many reasons, um, but we can do it. To Andy's point, the science shows us uh, that the oceans will regenerate if, we give, it the, if they give, we give them the space and we focus on restoration. So seaweed aquaculture is our core initial strategy because we see that it's fundamentally scalable and provides so many benefits to the oceans and to climate. Uh, with our particular blue carbon project, what we're looking to do is quantify the relationship between seaweed and carbon so that all the seaweed farmers out there, there's about 6,000 kilometer, square kilometers of seaweed farms around the world, about 95% of them are in Asia, but so that all those seaweed farmers who are delivering carbon benefits as well as other ecosystem benefits can get paid for that um, to enhance their revenue generation and to focus their attention also on doing work in a regenerative way. And maybe through our scientific study, we find out uh, what are the aspects of seaweed farming that uh, enhance carbon sequestration so that we can then design the first carbon optimized seaweed farm. Um, we hope with that research and science and the development of a protocol that will allow those farmers to sell credits on the voluntary carbon market that will be able to enhance the social license for seaweed farming in the West where it's often faced some opposition um, to really scale it up in a nearshore environment and then to go offshore, which is where seaweed really needs to go in order to, to deliver on its climate and its ocean restoration potential. So we see that it's possible for seaweed farming to, uh, to uh, draw down up to 10 gigatons of CO2 by 2050, um, which would be put it, you know, if folks are familiar with the drawdown list of different solutions to climate change, you know, somewhere in the mid teens on the list, not so far away from offshore wind, it's possible. Um, we're doing the science to really demonstrate uh, and advance our understanding of it. Uh, and we really believe that it's one of the fundamental solutions that will help us address the climate and the oceans challenges, as well as to, to you know, uh, to the points mentioned previously, offering real quality jobs to out of work fishers and folks who depend on the ocean and helping to address food security challenges for, for the planet going forward. And Megan, am I right at the outcome of this, if it, if it all pulls together, there's, there's new product creation around carbon that, that can be sold traded that goes back to, to the beginning of the system, right? To engage job creation for restoration. So really you're bringing your, your years of skills and talents in investment banking to new inv innovative technolo technology as well as thought processes here. Very exciting. Yeah, no, we're absolutely, we're looking to bring new revenue streams in and farmers should get paid for the restoration that they're providing. They're absorbing carbon. There's also opportunities in water quality markets because seaweed absorbs nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, we're looking at potential other payments for ecosystem services like biodiversity. Um, and absolutely, this is something, this is a way I can add some value um, to this broader climate conversation and to the effort to restore the oceans. Awesome. Leah, can you come back to us? We'd lo love to learn more. You know, as you launch the initiative, you've grown. Uh, what, what I thought was so impressive was these advisors, people that are coming uh, around the world to support your work. Um, what do you attribute that to? And, and, and what should you highlight for all of us as, as part of this education and awareness? Yeah, so a little like Sam, when I started the organization, it wasn't, this wasn't kind of my dream since a young child to go into the ocean conservation space. It really came out of a sense of urgency. Um, for me, the oceans was, you know, this happy place and I realized how important it was um, and also how much was at stake. So really when starting Oceanic, one of the things that I wanted to do was not recreate the content wheel. There's so many amazing organizations out there. So instead we decided how are we going to partner with synergistic groups to highlight and amplify the work that they're doing and also find kind of a niche within it. So that's why we actually, um, we have so many amazing advisors as well as different nonprofit partners, many who are actually on this panel today. Um, and that's really kind of the ethos of how we started it and how we've grown from that. 
And then in terms of, you know, the impact and the change and working together towards this mission, um, what we found was to really create behavioral change at all levels, it needs to happen in an individual community, industry, and also policy. And again, knowing that we weren't going to be able to do all of it, how can we partner with different organizations to kind of drive the necessary um, steps forward. So we're very much focused on the individual and the business. And we've noticed that as a result of the combination of both, sometimes policy um, will actually happen. So for example, when we went down to Barbados to help them eliminate single use plastics from their operations, um, this was actually aligned with one of their goals to go plastic free uh, that they implemented last year. And we really brought the hospitality industry together to help them through this, but also touching upon things like the local waste management infrastructure available, because there isn't one size fits all to all of this. But at the same time, we brought in six different nonprofits to help us through this, that we're doing programming throughout the year. So we weren't just coming in, you know, helping educate and leaving, but really looking at empowering these solutions and making sure that there was measurable impact happening beyond um, that inclusion of that specific program. Great. Uh, I'm going to go over to Andy and we're going to do a bit of a round robin here briefly to close out and we, this, this session we can talk for hours uh, is, is coming to an end pretty quickly. Andy, let, let, let's talk about climate change, the impact on the world real quickly. And, it, and if you can weave in a call of action to that, and, I, and I'd ask each of you to close the same way. So if, if we could start off with you, Andy, please. Um, people should know that if they help us rebuild an abundant ocean, um, they're helping to stop climate change. They're doing that in three ways. Carbon sequestration, we've heard about a lot already. Um, wind power, ocean wind power is a big opportunity. But the thing that people don't know as much about is livestock production is a big driver of climate change, a big driver in the world. And so in the year 2050, you want people eating a lot of fish instead of hamburgers, because every time you eat a fish, Fill a sandwich instead of a hamburger, you're actually helping with climate change because fish don't release methane. So that's the kind of the, the, the call to action I have is that people need to connect that those two dots that like the oceans, rebuilding ocean abundance as a food resource is good on its own, but it also helps with this enormous problem we have of climate change. I, I love personal action items that are all very much in, in reach, and the aggregate seems like it could be a profound difference, Andy. Thank you. Sam, can I, can I jump to you, please? Sure. Uh, well, again, thank you to everyone on this panel for the work you're doing. This is really inspiring, and um, it's, I think, indicative of the fact that everyone can help protect the ocean. Um, so if you live in a democracy, um, vote for leaders who will act on climate, and then once they're in office, hold them accountable. Um, if you are a policymaker or a, uh, a financier, think about how you can help jumpstart the restoration economy as we also look for ways to mitigate climate change threats. I think as has been alluded to, there's an incredible economic opportunity uh, to restore these ecosystems that in turn also protect them. Um, and if you want to support Coral Vita, you can go to our website, www.coralvita.co, um, adopt a coral, and, and when the borders open back up, uh, we hope people will come plant corals with us and uh, help create a, a global community that is restoring the ecosystems that sustain us all. I love it. Adopt a coral. What a great gift. You gave me the next idea for the, the next birthday present. There Thank you, go. Sam. Leia, please, if I can go to you next. Yeah, um, you know, with it being climate week and talking about oceans here, I think we also need to think about the oceans as this undervalued and unseen hero. So when we're talking about climate change, you know, just the role that oceans has played in that, in absorbing heat, um, CO2, et cetera, and also really taking it as the early signals of what we're seeing on land. Um, so really starting to make that connection a lot more apparent. And then in terms of what we can all do, I think, you know, Andy um, and Sam really touched upon it, but if I was going to bring it back to a human level, it's really 
making decisions with the environment and ocean in mind. So as simple as that, in whatever role or position of power you have, just really making conscious decisions um, that will take the health of our planet into consideration. A greater recognition that uh, our planet is one, we're all part, and taking that personal responsibility. I, I think you're absolutely right, Leah. Megan, bring us home. Tell us what you're thinking. Well, I'm a climate activist and uh, as well as an ocean activist. And I'm just going to say that there is nothing more existential than making sure we have a planet to live on, period. Um, there is no planet B. Planet doesn't necessarily care if we're not. In fact, we're probably not here. In fact, it would probably be better off if we weren't. But if we're interested in our own survival, we need to vote. Um, I say this as an American, um, which is um, in this election that's coming up, um, which is deeply important. If there are Americans listening, vote like our lives depend on it because they do um, and hold those leaders who you elect accountable. And the same is true uh, to Sam's point in other democracies. Understand just how deeply important this is um, and join the fight. And at the same time, don't lose hope. Um, I, I start with the, I guess I started with the fear and the scary, ta the scare tactics, but I want to end with the hope because it's true. This is a problem we know how to fix. Unlike human inequality and lots of other challenges that have been with us since the beginning of humanity, we actually know how to address the climate problem. We know how to restore the oceans and we have the funding to do it. What we lack is the political will and the commitment. And we really need, um, collectively to decide just how important this is and to elect leaders or to choose leaders and in our own capacities to the maximum extent we can to make decisions that reflect those priorities uh, and the importance that these issues need to have in our daily lives because our, our fundamental existence and that of our children and our grandchildren really depends on it. Megan, we know how to do perfect. That. That's my answer. Well, Don't lose hope. Join we, us. we do know how to do it. We have the technology. We have the resources. We need a bit more of alignment to get it done. And at, to this point, thank you all for the work that you're doing, your organizations, the visibility, the awareness, the action, the, the innovation. Uh, truly, um, on behalf of all of us, thank you. And, and thank you for taking your time and sharing your thoughts and wisdom with us today. I'm Kavita Gupta. Welcome to the NEST Summit for Climate Week 2020 from Javits Center, New York City. Um, there was a time when we used to think of Amazon and an image of greenery, big rivers, exotic animals would come in your mind. But in last decade or so, the word Amazon reminds us of fire, burnt trees, smoke, illegal burnings, injustices towards indigenous population, and government and corrupted government. Today, um, I have stalwarts who has been working in this space for over a decade to share with us what has been the transformation, why Amazon is very important, not only for that hemisphere, but for all of us around the world. I'm very excited to have Atosa Sultani with us. Atosa is the founder and board president of Amazon Watch and she's the recipient of 2014 Hillary Step Prize. Hello, Atosa. Thank you so much for taking time out for us today. Thank you so much, Kavita. It's great to be here. Um, Atosa, the fires have increased in Amazon. It has gone 28% higher this year than last, which was considered the deadliest. Um, what has been happening there and why Amazon is so important for all of us that we should all think about it? Um, so yeah, Kavita, it's a great question. Uh, the people have heard of Amazon referred to as the lungs of the earth. Uh, really, scientists are telling us it's more like the heart of the world as well. Uh, the way the Amazon basically captures CO2, breathes in CO2, and breathes out oxygen uh, is why they call it the lungs of the earth. 
And now with science monitoring, seeing that the Amazon actually trees in the Amazon, billions of trees in the Amazon generate vapor and moisture into the atmosphere, that an average tree lifts up a thousand liters of water a day into the atmosphere. And collectively the trees in the Amazon generate these atmospheric rivers that drive rain and cool the planet or the air conditioner of the earth and the, uh, you know, the rain machine for the planet. In fact, uh, not only for South America, but for the entire um, continent and around the world. The moisture content, for example, over the Sierra Nevada and California is in part determined by rain patterns in the Amazon. So, um, so this is really a vital organ of the biosphere, uh, the heart and lungs of the earth, a vital organ that we cannot survive without. And so what's happened is that while there's you know, wildfires in California that were all over the West Coast actually uh, this week, what we're seeing in the Amazon are man-made arson fires, fires that are set when the rain has diminished, you know, the rain's dry season comes uh, after a long uh, period of actually chopping down the forest and letting it dry, they now set it on fire. So we are seeing an unprecedented set of deforestation and the fires are just basically the end result of all of that cutting and burn, and now they're set on fire. And yeah, it's been, right now there's 35,000 fires happening in the Amazon. And this is so far since January until today, we have lost in the Amazon an area bigger than the state of Rhode Island, uh, a really huge area of the forest. And what we're seeing is this is as a result of policies of the Bolsonaro administration and basically uh, criminal uh, activities, illegal logging, illegal uh, cattle ranching, and policies by the government that encourage the, the people go out and burn and destroy the forest supposedly for economic livelihoods, but really uh, corporations, a handful of corporations benefit. And what we're seeing is the climate stability of the region is affected as is the climate stability for the entire planet because the amazon we can, it's basically the amazon is key to climate stability for the entire planet it is so sad like we are literally going and hurting a soul it feels like that for a human body um you know at this point because i want to connect this people who actually are from Amazon, the indigenous population. And I want to bring in Suzanne, uh, whom you know very well. Um, Suzanne Pelletier has been an executive director of the Rainforest Foundation since April 2009. She leads the work to partner with indigenous, popul uh, indigenous um, population in Central and South America to help them assert their rights and conserve their forests and natural resources. Uh, Suzanne, it's a pleasure having you here with us. A pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, what's going on with the population out there? We hear so much about, uh, you know, protests happening, uh, especially during the fire. Uh, what's been your report? Like, what's the updates from your end? Um, well, right now, I mean, Atosa just gave a really great overview of what's happening right now with the fires um, and how it's all stemming from deforestation and the indigenous people in in the amazon they are the protectors of over a quarter of the entire amazon basin so they are directly affected by the deforestation that's been happening in the amazon they're really on the front lines of protecting the forest um, and which means that they're also on the front lines of these fires throughout throughout the amazon um, and right now, last, last year was tragic and was front page news um, right now, the end of August and in September. Um, and right now, and for, unfortunately, the fires, like Atosa said, are even larger this year. Deforestation has been larger, but the media and the indigenous people are suffering even more than last year, particularly because of COVID, the impact of COVID-19 also in their communities, but it's not on the front page of the newspapers anymore. Um, and the situation is, is even worse. Um, so what we're seeing um, is that communities are being adversely affected by, by COVID-19 and unfortunately, 
while many of us in, the, in around the world have been quarantined and sort of thinking that business stopped during, um, during the epidemic, unfortunately, deforestation has skyrocketed for the communities in the Amazon because government wasn't looking. Um, and they also weren't working as much and weren't actually investigating the illegal activity in the forest. So the communities have really um, been adversely affected right now from the deforestation, fires, and um, COVID-19. Wow. I think something which you said that it's not on the front page anymore. All these things are happening. Uh, you guys have been reporting about it everywhere on online and social media, but we don't see it on mainstream news channels. Um, I think at that point, I want to introduce two other uh, panelists who are influencers from their field. John Quigley, um, an amazing artist. He's the artist behind many powerful aerial photos installations, director of Artists for Amazonia, and on the board of EMA. We are very excited also to have Wendy Malik, uh, an American actress known for her roles in various television comedies like Dream On and Just Shoot Me. Um, and she's one of the founding circle, uh, founding partner uh, for Artists for Amazonia and on a board of EMA. Um, and a very passionate climate activist working very closely for the cause. Uh, thank you so much for both of you to join us today. You're welcome. Thank uh, you, Kavita. So um, I'm, I'm basically connecting what Suzanne just mentioned. Um, it is not the front news anymore. Um, what can influencers like you, what can people across the world can do to start paying the much needed attention to this topic? Well, I think our, our job at Artists for Amazonia is to tell the story. And I believe the story of the Amazon and the fact that it's reaching a tipping point. And if we go through uh, the threshold of that tipping point, we will lose the Amazon and the function it provides for global weather stability. And so part of our job it has been reaching out to influencers, to storytellers of all sorts, whether it's directors, producers, actors, actresses, musicians, to elevate the Amazon in the climate story because climate stability depends on a healthy Amazon. And that's where Wendy and I have been for years, she's been for decades now on the board of Environmental Media Association, which is about telling the environmental story and now she joined our founding circle of artists for Amazonia to help tell this specific story, which is absolutely crucial right now. When you talk about climate, Amazon needs to be the next point because if we don't save the Amazon, everything else we're doing is not going to stop the climate chaos that's coming our way. Go ahead, Wendy, please. No, and just uh, building on what John just said, what we took on at Emma and and something uh, which is a a group environmental media association is trying to be the voice for all these amazing people who are doing the work on the ground so much of this is invisible to so much of the world but once you know what's happening you then can actually take action to try to prevent the madness and the destruction you know and right now more and more i think people are seeing around the world that the climate is changing very, very quickly. And at the source of all of it is the Amazon, which a lot of people don't realize, but as Atosa said, that is the heart and lungs of the planet. And without that, we are in even worse shape than we are now. So it's incumbent on all of us to start making some really smart choices, letting our voices be heard, elect leadership that will help us get on the right track, which we don't have right now. And we don't have any time to waste. I completely agree with you. I don't. I think it's an emergency. It's it's urgency is undeniable, and um, especially this year with COVID, we see even much more. Um, you know, impact coming, uh, impact in the sense that there are no news coming from that space, also the local population. Uh, I feel like the atrocities are increasing. Um, what can we do? Uh, to basically help during, especially at this time, uh, which anybody around the world can just do it from where they are to help people out there? Well, I would suggest one thing is 
put your money where your mouth and your heart are. So for people who have any sort of investments, you can do this from home. Talk to whoever you invest with and make sure you're investing in sustainable businesses. There are corporations that are causing a lot of this destruction and harm. And if you care about this planet, you have to be a world citizen and really make meaningful choices about what you buy, where you put your money, what, what causes you choose to be on the front lines for, and to make your voice heard. And one of the most important things people can do in this season is make sure you get out and vote and talk to your friends and family and colleagues and make sure they know what's at stake this time around because it is the very survival of this planet. Yeah, completely agree, November 3rd. Um, so I have a question for all of you, actually. Um, uh, during your travels, in, um, to Amazon, um, can you share with us like one story or one incident which really completely changed the way you thought about the place or the issue um, and left a really lifelong impact on your life? I guess I can jump in. Uh, there's so many, it's hard to point to one. I've, I've had the honor and the and, and a, really the privilege for 30 years to spend time in the Amazon. Um, been there countless times and, you know, the Amazon basin, just to give audience an idea, is, is um, at the size of the continental United States. It's massive. Uh, they, and it covers nine countries. I've been to um, seven of those nine countries and had have uh, the opportunity to work with indigenous peoples. I, w I would say the one of the most uh, powerful experiences is sitting with indigenous peoples in Ecuador, for example, um, I've also in many other places as well, and really learning from them, learning their knowledge of the forest, the way they relate to the forest as a sacred living entity that's alive, the way they see the forest as, uh, you know, where their ancestors are and where the unborn generations are. Uh, sitting in circle with them, what they do is dream ceremonies. We wake up 3 or 4 a.m. many, many mornings. You wake up early at that hour, drink a, a, a kind of a lightly caffeinated tea called Wayusa, and you share your dreams with the community. And everyone takes turn telling their dreams and getting an interpretation of what those dreams are. And they're focused on the dream culture. They They basically say, it starts very symbolic, but it has all this wisdom about how we're not going to get out of the problems we're in through some kind of a rationalization process. And we're going to get through this process through our heart connection, our relationships, and our, our envisioning the future in a way that is uh, really um, transformative, not just about changing one thing or another thing. And so and they see themselves, you know, they've taught me that, that um, the relationship is the most important, the relationship between the, among the community, the, from between the community members and the forest, between various indigenous uh, nations that live there, and then the relationship with, of the Amazon with the world. And so um, I would say that uh, their message for us is to connect with be indigenous to where you're from, be connected to the land where you are and care about it and think about the seventh generation ahead and seek to live in balance and in relationship with, with that earth. And I know it seems philosophical, but you know we can't change the system we're in until we change the focus of the system. And part of changing um, the focus of the system is to have a you know, deeper relationship, a deeper connection to recognize that, you know, just like the earth is a living organism and the Amazon is like the heart of the planet, that we ourselves are members of that community of life and can be contributing just like cells in a body keeps us alive. We can be contributing to keeping our forests, our communities, our rivers, our watersheds alive wherever we are. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's a really beautiful story. And I want that tea next time. <laughs> um, Suzanne? Um, I think I would say it's not it's similar to what <laughs> um, Atosa was saying, not one particular incident, but what has been reinforced to me over and over again as I've um, been in communities and talking with leaders is that connection and oneness with their with the environment 
when we grow up in the United States, I never, I don't feel, I never grew up feeling that connection. It was almost a luxury, you know, nature was almost a luxury, but to really hear how they don't, you know, so many times they don't distinguish um, uh, the environment as different from their, from their community. It provides everything. It's part of a living system and you can't separate one from the other. You know, they will always say it's our for, it's our pharmacy, it's our supermarket, it's our spirituality. You take, take it out and they lose who they are. Um, and so that has been a really impactful message that I've received from all of the communities that I've, that I've visited. Um, I think you're talking about the terminology which I've heard is like universal oneness, which I think in this country we have to really work to understand comparatively to those cultures where you are born with it and that's the part of your growing up. Mm -hmm. wow. um, John, Wendy, mm -hmm. an amazing story, an amazing mm -hmm. impact. Well, I will, two beautiful stories here and I have many as well. Uh, and I'm going to recount a story that was the most hard hitting for me, which is traveling to northern Ecuador to what they call the rainforest Chernobyl, uh, an area where Chevron, Texaco left a thousand unlined oil pits. And Atosa mentioned the state of Rhode Island. I remember this being uh, spoken to me that there was an area the size of Rhode Island where there was no drinkable water in the rainforest. And in 2007, I went there with Amazon Watch and their team and we toured, we did a toxic tour of these pits and met with indigenous people who all of them they had lost children, they had lost parents, they had, there were birth defects, all from the toxic contamination of this, uh, this oil drilling that had been left behind just the, the mess. And it really was the mess of our civilization, of how we go about our lives on a daily basis. And seeing the pain in how paradise could be turned into this sort of living hell by what we put into our gas tanks every day. It really reinforced for me this commitment to work on behalf of, of the Amazon and nature and the spirit of the indigenous people that I've been blessed to meet is so, as, as both Atosa and Suzanne were talking about, there, there's this spirit of life um, and life affirming quality that just moves me to my core. And to see that desecrated by American companies who just had zero respect for human life or for nature, that left an indelible mark in my psyche and helps drive my passion to this day. That completely makes us question like as American, what are we doing? And like, how are people still investing in those company stocks knowing that there are, uh, you know, so many human right violations which are happening and you still have them as a listed companies. Uh, but I, I think to that point, uh, I have never, I have not been to the Amazon. I told them I'm signing up for the next trip as soon as we're allowed to go. Uh, I have been to Brazil and, uh, but never quite made it to the rainforest. Um, but I think to your point, that's what a lot of people don't understand is that they may be purchasing products and investing in companies that are causing this destruction. And it was something that was so moving to me at one of the first meetings we had was seeing some of the indigenous people who are defending, they're on the front lines of the Amazon and seeing their courage and this kind of gravitas that they they had and knowing that they are willing to die for this and there are people who are dying on the front lines trying to protect this thing that we all benefit from this living organism that is the amazon and just being in the room with them i was very aware of being in the presence of something quite remarkable and extraordinary and a kind of courage that i have rarely rarely seen 
a kind of a kind of commitment to doing whatever it took to try to save this precious resource that we all depend on, whether we understand that or not. Yeah. I think before I go to call for action, um, I again, Suzanne, Asoda, I, I really want to come back and ask you, you have been there some multiple times, you have been working on this, like dedicated your whole life to the mission. Um, have you seen any improvement over the years or have you seen only things being deteriorated over the years? Oh, I think what, what gets us, what gets me through the day is seeing things that actually work in progress. And um, there's absolutely been improvement in certain things. One, the, the indigenous movement over the past two decades, where we, Rainforest Foundation has been around 30 years, um, the movement has has become so much stronger in Latin America. Um, so, and to really see their voices heard in forums and in places that they they never were 30 years ago is inspiring and progress. Um, to see recently, even in you know at the international level, to hear multinational companies you know consulting with indigenous people, to hear governments. Um, in, engaging with indigenous peoples. Now, granted, it has a need. We need. We still need a lot more work, um, but there has really been a lot of progress on the advocacy front, for sure. Um, and then there's um, progress at the local level, also. Um, you know, something that we've been working on a lot at Rainforest Foundation that's really given me a lot of hope is um, doing engaging in, with um, tech, technology training at the community level with indigenous peoples. Um, and we're seeing incredible results um, of using, you know, over the past 10 years or so, there's, there's very inexpensive user-friendly technology that can be integrated with traditional knowledge and practices at the local level that in combination is protecting forest. Um, and so what we've done is we're working with the indigenous federations and leadership um, to be able to take remote sensing data of deforestation in the Amazon and to, to put that into simple maps and train community level monitors to then be able to take that information and be much more efficient in the way that they, they monitor their territories. And that integration of taking the satellite data to make it efficient at the local level, communities that don't have Wi-Fi or um, or cell service, they, they couldn't access that data that we can access here in New York in my office. I can go on Google Earth and go on you know, other platforms and see what's happening in their territory and they didn't know it. Um, and so now on a monthly basis, we're engaging with these communities to give the, bring them maps of where deforestation is happening, enabling them to use these simple smartphones um, now to take video and photo evidence of the illegal activity on their territory, then bring it to their communities and the community elders and um, the community assembly can decide what they want to do, whether they want to take, to take matters into their own hands at the local level or if they feel that it's too dangerous or too large a scale where they need to engage the, the government. And by doing that, that combination, it's protecting forests. So I really see that as a model. It's inexpensive and something that can be scaled across the Amazon. So I'm, I'm um, hopeful about that. Wow. I'm, I'm very excited about this technology and it's a combination of AI and blockchain, which you use over there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now we're, we're beginning to in integrate blockchain technology because we're really looking to create a system that is transparent um, and immutable so that the evidence that communities are, um, are producing can be really taken seriously and trusted. And so that's why we're integrating, we're just, we're using the technology that we feel is the most effective. And so blockchain, because of the characteristics of um, um, immutability and um, transparency, we feel that it would, it's important to integrate those, those two um, and hopefully disrupt some systems um, that right now are, 
are preventing finance from getting to people at the community level that are actually protecting the forest. Money from international money is often never reaches the people that are actually doing the work. And so we're really trying to create a system that in order for forests to be protected for the long term, they need resources. And so we're trying to develop ways using technology where the resources can get directly to the people that are implementing the technology and saving forests. And that would become that would be absolutely revolutionary when it happens because that technology can be used across the world for similar communities across right. Africa, Middle East. And I think uh, you would do a big favor to a lot of other countries too with that. Um, Atosa, um, with you from your experience. So uh, I agree with a lot of what Suzanne said. I mean, I'm, I think uh, 30 years ago when I started this journey, uh, very few people had heard about the rainforest. And today people know about the rainforest, about the Amazon rainforest. Uh, we have in the last 15 years, the United Nations adopting Indigenous Peoples Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. You know, we have lots of companies get making commitments to deforestation free supply chains, although not hardly enough. So on, a, on one, uh, we've learned what works in terms of public policies and programs. Indigenous peoples are more connected, they're stronger. So I would say there is a greater awareness and a lot more policies. Uh, so at one level, we are making huge progress. On the other level, our economic system, the global financial and economic system has grown exponentially. And as it has expanded and expanded uh, to the current stage, it has become, it's basically an economic system that's life blind and is devouring the resources of the planet at a greater and greater scale. So while we're making advances on, on one front, the larger economic system is becoming a bigger and bigger threat to all of our survival. The money dominated lifeline system that's based on growth, infinite growth is really undermining everything. And what we need is a life centric system uh, that is basically honoring life honoring economic system that values, uh, you know, biological systems and human health and planetary health and that's what we're trying to transform to. So the Amazon's reaching a tipping point. Um, the, the, it's reached a point where um, the deforestation has reached a certain level around which a tipping point begins the unraveling of that hydrological system I was talking about. So the flying rivers, those atmospheric rivers being disrupted or off course, uh, the forest becoming more prone to fires, uh, more drying, more edge effect, and that we're seeing a dieback of the Amazon. And if we continue on the current trajectory, we will see a collapse and a dieback of the Amazon over the next five to five to ten decades. But really, that point of crossing to an, the unraveling is in the next five to ten years. So we, what we do in the next five to ten years, will determine the course of the Amazon for the next hundred years, a thousand years. So we are in a you know, tipping point of ecological unraveling and an urgency. We need to declare a state of emergency. We need to recognize I'm part of a panel of scientists of 170 scientists, mostly from Amazon countries. We're coming up with a, basically a definitive study of what it's going to take to protect the Amazon biome. We need a global treaty that says we cannot just, you know, we cannot allow the forest to collapse. And so we need a much stronger path forward. Although with their, as I agree with Suzanne, most of the solutions that we need are there. We just have to change the operating system from one that uh, where money values dominate to one where life values will dominate. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Atosa. You basically gave so much uh, for thoughts, food for thoughts. Um, very quickly in the end, I would love to have a quick call for action for everyone out there watching it. What can they do? Well, um, I'll just start saying, you know, the, um, Wendy mentioned a lot of it as be the person who cares about ecological health, planetary health, and whether it's the Amazon or your backyard. So that everything from who you vote for, who you uh, buy from, where you invest your money and what you consume. In fact, beef, cattle ranching and beef is a huge part of Amazon destruction. So we've got to take on our own personal consumption, but we also have to exercise our muscles as global citizens. 
we have to um, target companies like BlackRock, who are um, one of the biggest investors in Amazon destruction, but really not stop there. Learn more, you know, join groups like Amazon Watch and Rainforest uh, uh, Foundation, and also support the Amazon Emergency Fund. If you have the ability to make donations, indigenous peoples are uh, in uh, facing multiple emergency, both climate and COVID and forest fires. And so uh, what we're trying to do is through the Amazon Emergency Fund, we've come together as a movement, as an alliance of many organizations, raising money for frontline communities to get emergency aid to address their immediate COVID and uh, fire um, response. Thank you. Anything, anybody want to cover? Uh, I, I would just say that we're in the process of developing an Amazon rainforest platform for the election that we're gonna be reaching out to candidates to endorse and to pledge that they will support legislation that, that protects the Amazon. And there's a great example in Los Angeles where the LA City Council uh, created a resolution to stop purchasing from rainforest destroying companies, the stop the use of public funds for that. So keep a lookout for that. There will be a way through Artists for Amazonia and Amazon Watch to to understand who's running in the various races who act that, that have publicly committed to protecting the Amazon through their policies. Okay. I just want to add, add one thing um, is that this is, you know, your vote and your advocacy is not theoretical. It's real. And I just want to give the example of Brazil, where in Brazil from 2004 to 2014, Brazil decreased their deforestation rate by 75%. And a lot of that had to do with public policies, both having people in power that created public policies that were effect, then Im actually implementing those policies, not just having them on the books, which so many countries have, but actually enforcing them and really integrating technology to make sure that they were monitoring um, the effectiveness of those policies. So those, the three combination of those three things worked and it worked very quickly. So it can happen, it can happen. In the United States, too. <laughs> we have hope. Um, I would just, I would just say. Hello everyone, my name is Kavita Gupta. Welcome to Nest Summit for Climate 2020. Um, I'm so excited about the Climate Week, everything which we have got together. We are talking about financial sectors, green bonds, how to move billions of dollars into the climate impact funds. We have, to, we have basically talking to or have already talked to people who are doing grassroots level movements. One thing which stuck out was everybody is talking about how to do it for future. They want to create legacy, they want to leave legacy, they want to save the future. But what about the future? Have we actually gone to the youth activists, the people who will live through good, bad, ugly, whatever we're going to leave behind. And that is what the, their legacy is going to be or their life going to be. So I'm very, very, very excited to actually have people who have stake in whatever we create and need their seat on the table. Uh, amazing group of people across the world coming together and joining us to talk about youth activism and climate. And to host this panel, 
I especially have Patricia with us. Um, Patricia Wu is an Emmy award-winning journalist who has interviewed newsmakers including Barack Obama, Singapore Prime Minister, former Ford CEO, Alicia Keys and the list just keeps on going. She co-anchored CNN Newsroom live from Hong Kong and has been working with CNN in New York, Hong Kong and I'm sure Patricia has done so much work that we can have her on the panel separately. So I'm so excited, Patricia, thank you for joining us, especially for this panel. I am so excited. All of those interviews that you just mentioned, amazing interviews, but can I just tell you that I have been more excited about this panel because of this amazing young people that we're going to be talking to yeah. today. And don't they make you feel like we oh, didn't do anything in our life? Complete slacker. <laughs> complete slacker. I, I've spent the last two weeks since you invited me on this panel feeling like, what have I done with my life? <laughs> Uh, and this is the intro. This is the first time they're coming together because they are the part of UN Youth Advisory, right? Absolutely, yes. The inaugural Youth Advisory Group advising the UN Secretary General on climate action. I mean, for those of us who will never advise the Secretary General on anything, <laughs> it is just a privilege to have them here. So, well, we both are just 15 year old too, so maybe uh, we will get to do it. You never know, you never right? Know. Maybe maybe they can teach us a few things. Let's start. So, who are you introducing now? I'm going to start, and this is the hardest assignment that you've given me, <laughs> is to introduce, I, we could spend an hour introducing each of them, so I'm going to keep it as short as possible. Let's so, keep them humble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're going to keep you guys humble, but I also just wanted to give them more time to talk. So I'm going to start with Alexandra Villasenor, and she started her climate action at 13 and is the founder of Earth Uprising, which is not an organization, but a battle cry. And we're going to hear more about that later. And then we are going to move on to Vladislav Kaim, who is from Moldova, passionate about clean energy, environmental cooperation, and helped to shape the historic UN Youth Climate Summit. And my final introduction, I'm trying to keep these short as promised so that you guys get more time to talk, is Sofia Kiani, who is the founder of Climate Cardinals. With thousands of volunteers and youth around the world, this organization translates critical climate information into more than 100 languages. Amazing. Wow. And I have three more to add. And I'm feeling like these introductions can just take over the panel. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go very quickly, guys, just for the time. So of course, being biased, amazing superwoman, Archana Sareng from India. I love Archana, what you're wearing, by the way. Um, she's the indigenous. She's from the indigenous Khadia tribe uh, from Risa uh, with a master's degree in regulatory governance. Uh, next is Paloma, uh, who is from Brasilia. Uh, she's an advisor at Instituto Socio Ambiental. If I did mispronounce it, I apologize now. <laughs> uh, on social environment rights. And last but not the least, I'm very excited. We have Nisreen Alsain from all the way from Sudan. Uh, she's an environment and climate justice activist, started in 2012 in Khartoum. Super excited to have all of you guys. Archana, you are in the middle of big cyclone back in Orissa, right? I mean, the right, like the straight away, we can talk about the climate impact in Orissa with every year cyclones and floods happening. Tell us more about it and how you are working and how did you come about with all the movement around those cyclones and floods? Uh, thank you uh, for this beautiful introduction and yes, uh, Odessa, the state from where I come and uh, every year there has been cyclone and it's uh, we are prone to cyclone both in the summer and also the rainy season as well. So it is uh, the first uh, reflection which I had uh, while starting to act towards climate action is the indigenous community members are the ones who are protecting forests through the community led forest protection and are also leading a sustainable way of living. But when we have climate crisis which has a global impact, they are the ones who are most vulnerable and affected 
affected and this is also captured by ipbes report as well so that is how you know i wanted to voice uh, for them and uh, uh, speak that indigenous communities who have immense contribution but they are most vulnerable when it comes to the climate crisis and that is why their security is prior and that is why their recognition of the land and forest is very important and their livelihood security which comes from the recognition of rights is very important and talking about the floods and cyclones uh, which we had this year also amidst covid 19 which again reflects or makes us reflect that we are dealing through pandemic but we are also dealing through the climate crisis which for which we need to really act now and this should be an integral part in our covid 19 recovery efforts wow yeah. that absolutely true i think worldwide not just for india right absolutely mm -hmm. from india where archna is to california where alexandria joins us from we are seeing these devastating mm -hmm. um effects from the climate crisis you just came from the wildfires there yes uh actually you know a little background um I actually got involved in activism because of the California wildfires. So after seeing the destruction in Paradise, California, after the campfire, I realized that I had to do something and I had to take some sort of action because my home in California, it's always wildfires all around us all year round. And so that was the reason that I decided to become an activist in the first place, but it's happening again. California, the entire West Coast actually is on fire. There is a fire that started a couple days ago and it's at 163,000 acres and it's not contained yet. And so I think that that's just a great example that we need to be constantly pushing for climate action, but we also need to focus on mitigation and adaptation because we are already seeing the effects and we have to learn how to stay safe and survive in a climate changed world. And so Californians have to start adapting. Wow. And I think it's sorry, what oh, were you no, saying? No, I said as we all do. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, did you guys see the picture of San Francisco skies yesterday? With the yesterday? orange skies. My sister lives mm -hmm. there and she sent it to me from her window and I just said, if this does not say SOS, we need to do something. I don't know what does. I know. And it's same happening in Brazil. So if we go to Panama, like Panama, I mean, Amazon is burning, you know, and wildfires and how they are treating indigenous population out there it is i mean you are working with them directly please share with us what's happening there well it makes me really sad that here in brazil especially um also all latin america the way that people treat the indigenous people here because right now we have like the whole amazon burning we have the the state where i live in which is in the middle of the brazil burning we are in cities where you can see all of these images and be with the smoke with the with the things in the air because of the the fires and we don't even have like someone or some people in a position who can defend our lives we are in the middle of a pandemic for god's sake this air pollution makes the situation even worse and when it comes for indigenous people we had to enter with a judicial measure in our supreme court for at least to guarantee their their security inside their territories because they had to promote self isolation here because there were no politics that could um sustain their lives or make them feel safe inside their territory so they had to do that and really forbid every non-indigenous person to enter in there and right now as the covid is entering the territories and they are having to leave some of their houses because of the fire when they come to the cities for treatment for healthcare they don't have space for it our supreme court in brazil gave 30 days for the national government to give like a response and really deal with the situation for the indigenous people till now none has non response that was enough and it has passed the 30 days already so 
This is very, very disheartening. Yes, and the indigenous population, we keep hearing that over and over again as a common thread that they are suffering an outsized impact from this climate crisis. And I want to go to uh, Vlad now. When it comes to the impact of climate change of peop on people living in Eastern Europe, uh, I can uh, confidently say that uh, Eastern Europeans are, in a sense, the forgotten people of Europe when it comes to estimating the impact on climate change, of climate change over their livelihood. Uh, their stories are often sort of put aside because the issues that they are facing daily due to climate impacts of climate change may not be as spectacular, you know, as the wildfires you can, uh, like the images of which you can see right now. That doesn't mean that they are not going through a daily grinder of that, particularly if you take a look at the history of like how economy in the Eastern Europe was developing in the last decades. There was a lot of bias towards heavy industry and even though the socialist camp has been dismantled since 19, late 1989, there are still many regions and industries who don't just economically depend a lot on the heavy industries, but they are also associating in terms of identity with them. And here the importance of just transition kicks in because without that happening, it will be no contribution uh, to solving the climate crisis and also alienating uh, huge swaths of population in Europe. I mean, this just seems like, you know, you hear about it, it seems very global, but when you start going into the microeconomics of it or like how it is impacting different, different individual places, I just feel like it's like there is no depth. Like the, I'm feeling like I'm completely on the surface of understanding where it is. And I think I want to connect that, like how Vlad said that um, Eastern European people are somewhere forgotten mm -hmm. um, and take it to the completely different continent. Actually, I would love to talk to Nasreen now and say and ask about especially Sudan, which has been always in news about so much of fracking and oil and mineral. Uh, what has you been watching in Africa, in Sudan and how how has that impacted? Well, um, Sudan is not only um, one of the developing countries, but it's also at least developed countries. And uh, the effects of climate change not only affecting the life of the people, but it's also affecting the development. Normally, people graduate from being at least developed countries to a middle income country or a low middle income country. But unfortunately, in Sudan, we moved from being low middle income country to low income country. So we are actually moving backward. We are doing the exact opposite of development. This is not only because of uh, the government or the economics of the country, but it's also because um, Sudan is very much vulnerable country to climate change. More than 70% of the population and more than 6% of our um, export is depending on the natural resources. It depends very much on the crops, on the cattle, and etc., etc. So whenever we have climate issues, we have, whenever we have um, like um, uh, irregular rain pattern, uh, whenever we have a uh, high fever, so we, ha we have a very uh, much big uh, heat waves. Last summer, we always reached uh, 50 or uh, 49 Celsius degrees. Um, and um, um, in 2019, we actually reached, reached uh, 53 degrees Celsius. So it's affecting every, every side of the life. Not only that, but we started to be introduced to new um, kind of diseases like dung fever, like, uh, uh, like a big range of malaria cases. All of that is very much linked to, to climate change. <clears throat> in Sudan these days, we are living a tragedy. We are having a very massive um, uh, it's it's only five meters from my house. Uh, the Nile is flooding very much because this year we experienced um, a, a very heavy raining. It's the worst in hundred years, and um, the losses are now estimated with more than half a million. Actually, the last the last sta uh, statistic said more than eight hundred thousand people are now homeless. More than 12,000 houses are completely destroyed, and um, even in Khartoum, the capital, it's very much bad because uh, it's destroying the infrastructure. So, as I said earlier, we are not only stop uh, like 
we are not only stopping in one place, we are actually moving backward. Wow. So we have seen or and heard the eyewitness accounts from all the different regions of the world of this climate crisis. I want to bring it back to the USA and Sophia Kiani and kind of look at solutions. Um, what you are all doing to fight this global issue. Um, and I know for you, Sophia, a lot of your work centers around, you know, media, strategy, community, how we can all attack this together. Yeah, so my background in climate activism, my passion really started a trip to Iran, which is my parents' home country, because I'm Iranian American. And so I really resonate with what everyone is saying, because when I when I visited Iran, I realized that, you know, the pollution there was so bad, the air pollution that I couldn't see the stars at night. And there's also a Middle Eastern climate crisis happening where temperatures in the Middle East are rising more than twice the global average. But what I thought was the most striking was that even though this was, you know, disproportionately affecting my relatives, they didn't they didn't even know what climate change was. And I even found a statistic that found that only 5% of Iranian university students can properly explain the greenhouse gas effect. Um, and that's really why I decided to start Climate Cardinals because you know, the climate crisis is disproportionately affecting people of color, and yet so much of the climate movement is pandering to only English-speaking people, which I thought was a really huge problem, because in order to really tackle this crisis, we need to empower and educate a diverse coalition of people to be able to advocate uh, on behalf of their communities and talk to their government about what's happening to them with, like, first-hand accounts. Um, and so that's why we really are translating information into all these languages and trying to get them to people who will really benefit from the education education so that we can really elevate their voices and make sure that they're being heard because obviously we can't do this just alone. There are so many youth from all over the world who are passionate about this issue and so it's just about us giving them the tools and the platforms that they need to get their voices heard and of course that means media and strategy plays a part in that because if we're able to give them platforms you know on TV, uh, in magazines, in articles, then they really are able to talk about firsthand what's happening to their communities and we can get them the resources that they need and hopefully really make the world understand what we need to do in order to combat the climate crisis. Wow. Um, I, I think uh, this has been such a learning experience. I thought we we're going to talk about the climate activism, what's happening in US too, but all of the countries. But I feel like every continent has different issues. The topic about how just the educational process in a local language can mm -hmm. completely change how people learn versus the forgotten people from different continent altogether to how climate change is coming from profitability of minerals, but taking the country <laughs> back. It's been, um, it's been a really amazing experience to learn. I think um, Patricia, I would love to know what each of you are doing or other organizations which you really believe are changing this, the other youth around the world who wants to come and join you. Uh, what can they do? What are your call for actions? Arshana, you want to go first? Yeah. Uh, so I uh, strongly feel we need to redefine uh, the term experts. I think who are these experts? Because I strongly feel uh, now in this current era, people are you know uh, very much looking up to the perspective and uh, the information which is coming from the experts so i feel we need to redefine who are experts and when i redefine it i feel the indigenous communities members have wisdom and knowledge and they are the experts when I talk about it, because they have the lived experiences and know their ecosystem well, and they are managing their ecosystem. And that is why I feel they need to be taken seriously and they need to be an integral part of the climate action strategy. And having said that, it is very important to document, preserve and promote the traditional knowledge and practices, wherein I feel that specifically the indigenous youth can play an important role to go back uh, to the indigenous leader and have a dialogue with them and how we can emphasize on more and more documentation of our uh, indigenous traditional knowledge and practices. Having said that, I would also like to say that we youth, 
are the experts we know about our own issues we know about the issues which is having across our areas very well so we are the experts we need not look for anyone to tell us what is happening and look up to other people but we ourselves need to make ourselves experts and wherein we need to uh, identify the areas whether it is you know various forms of expression dance writing art literature any form and therefore i feel we ourselves need to be confident and have the will power and do whatever we can do in terms of our individual capacity at the same time make the policy makers accountable so youths youth should get a seat and indigenous people should get a seat right absolutely and with this youth advisory group the un is recognizing that the youth need a seat at the table and since we have alexandria here with us in the studio i wanted to get to you socially distanced just so that socially distanced yes <laughs> um but from 13 years old from the weekly rallies to and now the weekly strikes to now the virtual rallies mm -hmm. tell us about this journey and you know how other youth can join you yes so first of all i think that there has been so much activism that's happened in this past year that's amazing and i think that we still need to see more young people get involved in activism so much more and so i think that that's why education is very important and so my organization earth uprising focuses a lot on climate education internationally where we educate young people peer to peer on the climate crisis and that way more young people feel passionate and able to go and get involved in organizing and get involved in the movement and so i think that one thing that education is very important is it also leads back to your own personal story how are you being affected by the climate crisis as we've heard from all these amazing young people um we are all being affected in different ways and so it's very important for young people to see and reflect on their community and how they're being impacted because that way they feel passionate to do something and it makes them want to get involved in the solutions young people are the most efficient when it comes to looking at their communities and finding the actions that need to be taken and so when we get seats at the table like uh what was previously talked about then that intergenerational conversation is so much more effective when it comes to actually getting solutions to help people's communities. Absolutely. And I know that Vlad has also been passionate about education and yep. talking about the journey from activist all the way to specialist. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Vlad? Definitely. Uh in from my point of view when it comes to uh, youth involvement, uh we need to look at it, especially in the framework of uh, climate action, we need to look at at it as a ladder. And uh, being a passionate activist is the first step on the ladder that should follow further in order for your personal and your community impact to increase and uh, for that you need to go from activist to advocate to specialist you need to specialize you need to learn and uh, that's how ultimately you can uh, be the most efficient in what you do and uh, what you are actually passionate about Uh, I would also like to come a little back to the point that was uh, about the seat at the table. Actually, the guarantee of the seat at the table not just being a golden cage would be that competence achieved through constant education of ourselves. Because what sometimes it is seen in uh, the youth circuit when the youth representatives are invited to high-level decision for. Uh, is uh, that under this banner of caring for the future those who are supposed to represent the future ergo us we are just you know sort of paraded around without actually being able to be heard in terms of providing our input as professionals and uh, that's why it is uh, so important to be always ahead of the curve education wise invest our time and our resources in our specialization and to prove that we are at the table not just for the sake of our age but because we have something concretely and feasibly to put on that table and that we are not just the future we are already in fact present because we are suffering from the impacts of climate change the same way the generations that are preceding us do and we need them on the table as well absolutely no i agree um we have 3 minutes left so nasreen and paloma 
um, I, I think we all agree youth needs to ha be on the table. They deserve it. They absolutely has the right uh, qualification to say it. But from, as you mentioned about the communities, uh, what would be the call for action for both of you? Well, as for the communities, it is the same thing. Like, as all of my colleagues said, like the key for participation is education, is access to information, is transparency, is accountability. And this for, for the indigenous people, for the communities, for the quilombolas, for the traditional people. They all need to understand how they are going to be impacted and, and what this, all these technical informations mean for them to go and give their opinion. Like we have, Brazil signed the convention 169 of the International Labour Organization. That is said that the, it's needed consultation and the consultation should be um, given in ways that people can understand. And for that, my colleagues said perfectly, education, transparency, participation. So this is go for all society. We all have our voices and we all should should be heard. So for us to be heard and to effectively participate, we have to understand what is being discussed on the table and what this means. That's the only way we can have and give a good opinion on that. And for that, we need to be recognized as people who give opinions independent on who they are, who we are, indigenous, youth, traditional, and also our opinions should really guide the path in a way that uh, it, it makes a boundary. Because nowadays what happens is that people normally consult uh, indigenous people, youth people, and they just like take this as it was a conversation, but it's not a conversation. This is like how we want things to be done. Completely agree, Panama. Um, Nisreen, is there anything you would like to add here? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that we all have a responsibility to do. And um, uh, as all of my colleagues say, our responsibility at the Youth Advisory Group will be not only um, uh, making sure that we deliver young people's voices, but also we will make sure that everything keep very real. And uh, we will make sure also to give the very much uh, honest advice to the Secretary General, because our f first and last priority is the planet and the environment. And our first uh, concern is our future and the next generation's future. Very Absolutely. Impressive. That is a perfect last word for us, because there is no planet B. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, really really appreciate Sophia do you quickly want to say something here sure I mean I would just like to add that I think it's really important for us to realize youth should not be tokenized when we're tokenized and not taken seriously that is when people get discouraged and they stop engaging in climate activism if you want young people to have a seat at the table you need to take them seriously and you need to provide them with feedback on what you are actually doing differently once they give you advice absolutely Patricia Thank you for inviting me. This was wonderful. I've learned so much. Thank you so much, guys. And I'm sure now the UN General uh, Secretary is in very safe hands and very, very smart hands.
Hi, and welcome back to the Javits Center. We're live for the Nest Summit. And my guest this morning is Michael Lewis from DWS. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, thanks for inviting me. Michael, when we talk about climate risk, I, I think the hard part for people to grasp is how does climate risk interact with the financial markets? Can you give us a little insight into DWS's thinking about this subject? Well, this has been a topic that we've been looking at for a very long time, but I think it came into the mainstream when the Bank of England Governor Mark Carney identified these links of climate change to financial stability. And he identified three buckets, liability risk, that is using the law courts to people who feel that they've had financial losses attributable to climate change. We then have physical climate risk, which the United States is incredibly exposed to in floods, storms, drought, sea level rise. And then we have transition risk. Where is government policy going? Where is technology going? Where are consumer preferences changing? And so what investors are trying to do is trying to map these risks. So in a way we're trying to, what we thought weren't risks are actually quite material risks from an investment perspective. So let me give you one example. You can have a hurricane, for example, going through the Western Atlantic, hitting Puerto Rico, and you have a large number of US pharmaceutical industries and facilities located on that island, causing huge financial loss. Um, or you can look at transition risk and new technologies making a huge revaluation event within the auto sector. So we're all trying to understand where are these risks and where are these opportunities so we can really position our investments in the best way. I really appreciate that explanation. How does one go about then measuring risk in a portfolio context? Well, this has evolved quite dramatically over the last few years. Back in the day, a few four or five years ago, lots of people used to do carbon footprinting. So what that meant was trying to identify where the carbon concentrations in your portfolio, because presumably those are going to be the ones most vulnerable. Now that's sort of okay, but it really didn't help us when we have a storm or a flood or a wildfire, that's not going to really tell us which companies are at risk and which investments are at risk. So what's been interesting now, and in some ways there's good news, the data set is much more sophisticated. So when I look at transition risk, um, that is where the risks and opportunities from all this technology and government policy and consumer preferences, we, we've moved beyond footprinting and we've gone to something like 15 or 16 different types of methodologies to try and capture this risk. So this has been the challenge. Uh, what we do at DWS is we blend these approaches because we think each one has got something quite interesting um, to capture. Uh, and that's, that's the sort of the way that we tackle it. It's, it's evolving. I would say one of the big voids that we've seen over the last few years has been in terms of physical climate risk. We don't really have much data um, from companies where are the companies, where are their facilities, where are their customers, are they in flood zones, are they in, in drought areas, are they vulnerable to extreme weather storms? This is the sort of information we need and this is one area that really needs to get much better so we can have the appropriate data to map those physical climate risks as well as the transition risk which is a little bit more developed. So Michael, once somebody has identified these risks, how is an investor supposed to grapple with this within their portfolio? Well, I think one of the things to look at for is we use the investor agenda. Now, this is sort of a, a climate framework, if you will, that looks at various different channels as to, which, as to what an investor could do. So, for example, it looks at what are the climate investments you can undertake? What is the public advocacy you can undertake by pushing governments to do more? And more importantly, it can be the disclosure, pushing those companies to disclose um, more information as it relates to climate. And probably, I'd say the most important one is engagement. What are investors doing in terms of their engagement, their proxy voting activities? And I think there's a really interesting regional divergence here. European investors are very active in this area. So you can see there's a lot more scrutiny as to our asset managers talking, walking the talk, as it were, um, and what, are the, what is their record in voting in favor of climate resolution? Now there's some great organizations around the world, Ceres in the United States, Share Action in the UK, Morningstar, they all publish this data to show what asset managers are actually doing to assess their track record. Uh, I, you know, Europe, European asset managers, DWS, we were ranked number one in one of these surveys, looking at our ESG and climate resolution um, voting track record, 
the US guys, I'm afraid the bad news is you're not there yet. And this is where you're going to see huge resources being put into asset managers in the United States to really push that ESG and climate agenda through those resolutions. So I'm hoping that's what you'll see. And you'll see those lead tables and voting track records start to improve quite dramatically over the next few years. So, Michael, one of the issues that I think a lot of people have with climate change is that it's always spoken about as a 2150 or 2100 problem. And yet we're seeing around the world today climate risk affect us in many different ways, whether it's fires in California or storms doubling in strength in the Gulf of Mexico or heat temperature records being broken across the southwest United States. When we think about specific assets, what are the assets that are most at risk due to climate change? Well, I think the first thing to point out is you were identifying extreme weather events and people get it. They understand physical climate risk. And, um, and obviously certain asset classes are going to be more exposed. And inevitably the work we've been doing on real estate and infrastructure and also listed equity have been areas where physical climate risk is very relevant. But we've also got to look at transition risk. And your other point was, oh, isn't this something that we don't have to worry about? It's five, 10 years down the road. Well, no, it's not. You get Forbes, for example, identifying a coal company in the United States, an energy company, as its top pick, in a way, top 2,000 companies in the world. A year later, that company went bankrupt. Um, and similarly, we've seen it in, in auto factors, auto companies, Tesla, huge uh, market valuation, multiples of what Ford is. But these companies are showing um, how these revaluation events are taking, taking place today. European utilities is another example, the big right counties in this space. So this is something that is happening today. And let me just sort of give you another example. Fossil fuel companies, the oil and gas companies, what we've been seeing since June is write downs in this sector. And I'm very concerned of the fossil fuel sector over the next five years, you know, the, the potential that we'll see more write downs, more cuts in capex, the dividends being cut, and you'll start to see more talk of stranded assets that these assets aren't worth what we thought they were. And, you know, for a fixed income um, investor, you know, are those bond payments at risk? You know, these are sort of the very tangible risks that we face. And it's, it, it's spanning, as you say, the physical events and extreme weather events, we can see them. Um, but I think these transition risks, people think they're hidden, but they've actually been going on for quite a number of years and likely to accelerate, in our view, as, with, as technology accelerates. And potentially um, federal, but more likely in the US, provincial state uh, legislation starts to accelerate in this area. Michael, is there any way we could leave our audience with some positive notes, though? I mean, with everything going on with climate change, are there positive or optimistic signs that we're seeing in the capital markets? Well, I, I put optimism based on three things. I put it on technology, I would put it on government action, and us as individuals. Now, technology, I am very optimistic. We've seen huge uh, advances in technology, and this isn't just a sort of a renewable story anymore. This is affecting all the energy systems, our transportation systems, our food systems. This is spreading across all parts of the economy. And I think one of the critical things to remember is we've got an opportunity here. Europe, we're all talking about green deals, and you're talking about that a little bit over in your part of the, of the world. And we're seeing a lot more acceptance that if you want to create jobs, climate action investments are the best way to do it. There are multiple uh, multiplier effects actually focusing on these energy efficiency sectors. So I'm really optimistic on technology. Government policy, you know, it's a little bit hot and cold, depending on where you look. Um, and I, but I do think there are certain parts of the regions that are responding. And in terms of us as individuals changing, well, I think, you know, if there's an optimism of this pandemic, we are looking at new ways of how we live, how we work, and how we interact and value nature. So I think mindsets are changing. So hopefully those three things coming together, I think could provide a lot more optimism that we can actually sort this problem out because it is hitting us right in the, in, in the front door of our investments at the moment. So Michael, climate change is a risk and an opportunity in some cases from the financial markets viewpoint at least. Can you just give us a little bit of sense of both sides of that coin and how DWS looks at financial instruments? Yeah, so I mean, one good example is when you try and map climate risk, you suddenly find within a sector like industrials, a huge range of different players within that market. You've got at one end, the marine transportation and the airlines, which are heavily exposed to what's going on on climate risk. They have very high polluting 
um, business models, and they really do need to change quite dramatically. And those pose quite a lot of risk for holding those investments over the next five to 10 years. But within that same sector, you can move along and you can see companies operating in building materials, energy efficiency, which actually offer incredible sort of gold nuggets of investment opportunities. So I think this is why it's, it's dangerous to sort of exclude all sectors. You know, sector exclusions is something that people talk a lot about. We go a little bit more granular to subsector individual securities to actually see the range of investment opportunities. And I, and I think maybe to leave it on this, more and more investors are operating their investments according to the agenda of the sustainable development goals. They're looking at where public policy is going and making sure that their investments on the right side of that public policy and those sustainable development goals. So I think this framework of the SDGs will become more important. It is something that we are at DWS embedding into how we look at our investments, uh, as well as norm-based screens. And let's not forget, COVID has really raised this, not just this environmental issue, but this social issue as well. And for us, corporate reputation is incredibly important and in how corporates are looking after their employees, their contractors and their clients and their customers uh, and so I think that is another area that I think this pandemic has, has raised a lot more interest in the social aspects of what companies are doing. Just to finish, I think it's Sunday, it's the 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman's famous article that all companies have to do is make profit. We think that is entirely wrong. Um, that Friedman paper, I think, was written in the days of politics and the Cold War. What we're seeing is corporates play a much bigger role than just being um, uh, at the service of their stockholders, they have a much broader responsibility and that's what we're seeing emerge uh, and will increasingly emerge over the next few years. I want to thank Michael Lewis and DWS for joining us live at the Javits Center for the Nest Summit. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much.
We are live at the Javits Center for the Nest Summit, and today we're talking with Lisa Davis of PGIM about inequality, housing, and climate change. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. When people think about PGIM, and uh, I just want to let people know that is the, the new name for Prudential for those that, that haven't caught up yet, um, just so they're clear. When people think about PGIM, I, I don't know if they understand the depth of the work that you're doing around housing and how much you're concerned about inequality within housing. And then also to make it applicable to today's session, of course, how much climate change will actually impact people of you know, lower economic means around housing issues. Can you give us the kind of framework around what you're looking at at PGM today? Sure. So I'm a portfolio manager at PGM Real Estate. It's one of the asset management businesses of Prudential Financial. So you're right, it's uh, somewhat of a new uh, name for the asset management businesses. And in real estate, I uh, work on impact investing in private equity investments. And PGM Real Estate has been investing with a focus on ESG for many years. We were um, one of the first real estate organizations to have a sustainability practice. And at first it was largely focused on the E, right? So how do we make our buildings more sustainable, more energy efficient, more water efficient, less waste, less waste generation? Um, but I would say that really in the last four or five years, we've also began to take a very close look at the social part that in many ways comes from the legacy of our parent company. Prudential Financial is based in Newark, New Jersey. And as you know, Newark, New Jersey has had a pretty rough time of things uh, in the last half of the 20th century. And Prudential really stayed and focused on helping to support and revitalize and stick with that community through some pretty challenging times. And that took the form of both keeping the company headquarters there and investing economically in, in the city, but also focusing on revitalizing the city and investing in housing. And in fact, the balance sheet made a substantial number of investments in Newark and other places like Newark around the country to achieve both financial and impact returns. And then came to realize that there was also third party investor demand and uh, started to move towards building uh, a product in the asset management business, the real estate asset management business, um, that could also serve that dual mandate, the mandate of impact, in this case, largely focused on social inequality and financial return. So that's really where we um, got started and our legacy in this. When you're looking at some of the issues that we're facing today around climate change, what kind of time frames are you looking at? And also, if I could weave into that, I think a lot of people, when they think of the work that you're doing, put that in the lens of charitable work. Yeah. And uh, at PGM, you're doing it as an investment thesis. Right. So can you illustrate that point to people that may not understand the difference? Sure. Um, you know, I think the first point to make is to connect the dots between climate change and inequality. Um, I think so often when we look at climate change, climate change scenarios and investments, we're really looking solely at the assets we're investing in, or we're looking at kind of regional and national scenario planning. But the fact of the matter is that climate change impacts um, marginalized, underserved communities much to a much greater extent than other communities. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for this, and we see kind of the implications globally right now. So one could argue that the war in Syria is a climate change driven conflict. It's destabilized an entire region. We could argue that many of the migration patterns that we're seeing in the, Amer in the Americas from Central America up through North America and the resulting sort of national anguish that we are going through around that are a result of a drought uh, band that has spread through um, Central America, you know, all the way um, down to Panama. And that has forced people from their homes. It has created chronic health problems. It has created political instability and violence in those communities because of the scarcity of resources. So I think we have to come to a place where our scenario planning for climate change is not just about how much does the sea level rise and is my bridge going to be affected, but what does this mean at sort of population and societal levels for the upheavals that we, that we might experience. So I think that's the framework and we are very definitely there right now. It's interesting because when we look at a lot of the data providers that are starting to do climate risk analysis, 
One of the assumptions that it seems that all of them seem to make is stable population patterns. Right. And it's something that we keep going back and asking because when you have extreme heat and you have droughts and you have fires, people eventually move. Um, I mean, for uh, a million years before, maybe 12,000 years ago, we were a nomadic right. um, species until the climate stabilized. And now we're dealing with destabilization. And I think we've forgotten that when things get too bad, people move. But it's really great to see that you're addressing those issues. And unfortunately, like you said, it's the poorest communities who can't afford to just pick up and move. Right. Um, people of means can afford to move from Miami to Maine. Or they have the, insurance that covers right, the cost or they of have house. insurance that covers it. Yeah. Um, so when you look at resiliency as part of the solution, what are you doing specifically around investments? Can you give us some examples around the investments that PGM is making today? Sure. I mean, I think um, there's probably a couple of types of resiliency that we can think about. Uh, we can think about physical resiliency as a way to address physical risk that might occur in a particular property or a particular location. But I think where, um, back to this intersection of inequality and climate, uh, climate risk, that um, it's really uh, social um, resiliency that we are often focused on in making real estate investments. Maybe a little bit counterintuitive, how do you think about social <laughs> resiliency in real estate investments? But when we make investments in affordable housing or um, uh, workforce housing uh, or in community revitalization projects, we're making investments in a community, not just in a building. And our ability to earn a return, to keep those apartments full, to uh, create a quality community is really based on the health and well-being of the people who live there and the people who work there and the people who play and learn there. And so the types of things that we think about um, and uh, most of the investing that uh, we're doing in the impact side of things is residential, the type of things that we think about is how engaged are our residents. How are they advancing in their lives and how can we support them through programming um, and the physical plant of the uh, apartments to advance in their lives, to improve their health and wellness, to make sure their kids can get to um, good schools, to help support um, uh, you know, income resiliency and job, um, job connections. Um, and I think that has become especially important in this, in this time of COVID when families have become much less economically stable. You know, it's always so fascinating to me when I talk to you because I, I think what you're doing is you're doing system level thinking. And what we don't get at a lot of capital markets or asset management firms, we get a very kind of myopic view of an investment thesis for a short period of time and what are the quarterly profits. But when you're doing the kind of work that you're doing, you're investing for the very long term and you're looking at all these ancillary factors that might weigh into a scenario that make it appropriate to make investments that might not seem or might seem even counterintuitive and initially, but ultimately are important to the long-term value of the properties right. that you're investing in. You know, it works short term too. Like uh, it, it, we, we are, uh, we, the, the uh, work that I lead is in a closed ended um, vehicle. So we do have a, a time horizon. Um, and the research has shown that um, residents who feel a sense of community stay and the way you make money in affordable housing is when your residents stay and pay. So it is, it, it, there also is short-term value creation. When we're working on what we call a transformative development, which is essentially when we um, invest in uh, new construction, ground up, mixed use, mixed income, in an area that has experienced some disinvestment, um, the way that we create value is not just to create a building, but also to create a community, a high quality community where people want to live. And that value accrues, you know, accrues definitely over the long term to the community as the whole, but it accrues to the property uh, in the relatively short term. And one of the um, things that we see is that when we're first in in an area that is uh, improving, where there are other um, public investments most likely, that um, that value creation, we get a lower land basis, that value creation really accrues to the, to the first movers. And that's part of, part of the, um, uh, the shorter term play that we're making as well. It's interesting to me, we, we've seen COVID as kind of an early warning system for climate change. 
and because of the work that you're doing, are you seeing any positive effects during COVID because of the types of investments that you've made in these communities that are helping to support these communities through COVID? And then how do you think that'll carry out as a bigger picture of climate change? And I think it's a, it's a little early to tell how it's gonna affect the individual communities. Um, you know, there, there's a couple of things to think about. One of the things that's counterintuitive that we're seeing, we invest at, at the firm in um, a lot of apartments, luxury apartments, uh, a lot of class B apartments, um, and now some new construction in kind of uh, accessible housing in the suburbs. The performance in terms of arrears and vacancies is the best in the class B housing. It's the class A plus that is actually suffering from more arrears and, and more vacancies right now. So one of the things that I think that tells us is that when you're meeting an essential human need like housing, um, like affordable housing, like accessible housing uh, in places with good access to services, to healthcare, to um, walkable communities, that um, you see that that is resilient, and <laughs> there's that word again, right. over the market cycle. That right. um, it's, first of all, in the United States, unfortunately, the su supply demand characteristics are extremely compelling. There is not enough affordable, affordable housing. We built much more luxury housing than affordable housing in, in this last cycle, and the number of affordable units have declined. So there's um, a huge demand and a lot of people wanting to get into those apartments. Um, but they have proven to be more resilient because they're an essential, in some ways, an essential public good. And, and um, whether, you know, people don't have a choice about uh, needing to find a place to live. What are you seeing on the investor demand side, um, especially post COVID, post George Floyd, pre the maybe worst effects of climate change, although certainly seeing a lot of effects of climate change, are, are the investor conversations starting to shift a little bit? Yes, I, re I really think so. I think um, people have woken up to the idea that um, one of the great systemic risks to our financial system is not just climate change, it's inequality. Um, COVID is so bad in the United States, I believe, because of our unequal con conditions. So um, I think investors are starting to connect the dots. And then you add to that the fact that COVID has had a extreme disparate negative impact in communities of color. And the reasons for that are about health, but they're also largely about how our communities are built right. and where people live. Um, it's not because people that live there are somehow different or behaving differently. It's because they live in overcrowded conditions. They um, don't have access to healthy, fresh foods or safe, walkable communities. So there's a lot of chronic health conditions. Um, the they are served by public hospitals that are understaffed and underfunded and can't provide adequate care uh, for people that live in those communities. So when those communities um, are impacted by COVID, um, as long as those imp communities are impacted by COVID, we are all impacted by COVID. We will not see case counts go down. We will not see our children be able to go back to school full time until we deal with this, these conditions of inequality that are making COVID more uh, deadly and more um, transmittable uh, in certain communities. So I think investors are starting to understand the connectedness in new ways and understand the importance of addressing inequality as a systemic risk in investing in, in ways that we haven't seen before. And so the conversation is moving much more quickly, I think. Lisa, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. That's a wrap at the Nest Summit at the Javits Center, talking about inequality and housing and climate change. Thank you so much for joining us.
Joining me today at the Nest Summit is Ivka Kalous from Prometheus. Ivka, thank you so much for joining us at the Nest Summit. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff, for letting me participate. So Ivka, in the work that you do as an asset manager, I think we've seen that COVID has really driven the demand for ESG, certainly on the social side. Um, but as well, we're starting to see signs that on the climate side as well, there's more and deeper interest. Certainly fires in California, Australia, record heat temperatures. Do you think this is a fad being driven post pandemic on these issues and concerns by customers and investors? Or do you think this is a sustainable um, trend that we're seeing right now? Um, I, I think it's, it's really a, a super trend in terms of you know, the, what COVID did is that it exposed massive cracks and gaps in our social, economic, and policy frameworks that define our daily lives and has made us realize how vulnerable we all are, uh, which puts the focus on climate change and social justice as the greatest challenges of our time. Um, I think a lot of people, investors included, are frustrated by their lack of agency when they see the callous and cruel assault on human dignity that COVID and now the Black Lives Matter uh, movement have highlighted. And so the power of the purse seems to fill some of the agency void, both in terms of how people spend and how they invest. And I think it's permanent. I think it is, is going to leave a permanent mark on all of us. And we have to look forward and ESG investing in climate change and social justice is all about managing future and externality risks. So it fits really well with the desire to create a future that is brighter than the present. And so I think it's here to stay and the genie is out of the bottle. So post George Floyd, um, or at least pre George Floyd, we were seeing a big pickup on climate related issues. And obviously post George Floyd and the, the death um, of George Floyd, we are seeing an incredible demand from people across the, not just the United States, but Europe as well for social justice to become part of the conversation in the capital markets. Do you think these are two competing trends that we're dealing with and one is sacrifice for the other, or do you think both can be complementary to each other? Um, definitely the latter. Um, I don't think you can have uh, climate justice without social justice and vice versa. And what we do know is that climate change has a, a very significant social justice element in terms of impacting uh, disenfranchised uh, minority uh, poor communities disproportionately. And so, you know, that's from the moral side of the issue, but, but climate change is an all hands on deck kind of crisis. And there is so much lost innovation uh, when social justice is denied. And, and you know, there's, there's actually work done on this. Uh, there's a professor uh, named uh, Lisa Cook out of Michigan State who's actually quantified the amount, the economic impact of the lost innovation of, of racism in the US and she estimates it to be about 3% per annum. And that's in economic terms, but if you think about it, we need all of that innovation and participation to, to manage the crisis. So, so there's a direct link and you, you definitely don't need to just choose your topic of focus because they're, they're interconnected and both equally important. I appreciate those thoughts. Also, I just wanna ask you, when we think about what the pandemic has illustrated, for our least advantaged communities across um, not just America, but of course the globe. What does that illustrate on the effects that climate change is gonna actually have on disparate communities? Um, in terms of the pandemic, I mean, you, again, you have the same communities um, who have been impacted by COVID uh, communities, disadvantaged communities, uh, minority communities, immigrant communities, uh, and so if you think about climate change and, and the ability to adapt to climate change, uh, it requires some amount of uh, being connected 
being enfranchised um, some amount of wealth. And, and so it's the same, I don't want to say target audience, but it's, it's the same communities that will be impacted ne negatively by climate change as by COVID. And so COVID is, it, it's basically our, our trial run for how to deal with climate change. Uh, and so hopefully there'll be, you know, good lessons coming out of this in terms of, in terms of how to uh, resolve the, the crisis. In regards to what we're seeing in the papers today, we're seeing this resurgence all of a sudden of ESG skepticism, different studies that are coming out challenging the worth of ESG as an alpha driver or a performance driver, and really saying that it's because of growth tilts or lack of exposure to oil. When you look at that skepticism that's rearing its head these days, what are your thoughts about it as a portfolio manager who is deeply invested in ESG as part of your process? Yeah, so I think, I mean, it's always healthy to be skeptical of any trend in investing. Um, since once everyone jumps on board, uh, then the opportunity gets arbitraged out. And that's certainly the case with ESG. If everyone starts to value and consider the externality risks that are generated by, by corporations, uh, then ESG just turns into normal investing. And, and ESG investors will just be called investors. Um, but I think that we're still a long ways from that and there's still a lot of opportunity. Uh, but, but if you look at the current skepticism, there were a number of Financial Times articles and, and other articles elsewhere uh, that, that pointed out that most of the outperformance during COVID um, came from funds being overweight to technology and to growth. Now, never mind that there's an issue with pointing to performance over any three or six month period as being statistically significant, but that doesn't show that ESG didn't matter. It only shows that those managers made an allocation decision or a style decision that added value. Um, there's been a lot of other work done on ESG as standalone non-correlated factors and uh, a lot of that work, you know, there's there's more and more metrics to look at that that quantitative analysis can uh, analyze to look whether it's statistically significant or not. And a lot of the work shows that ESG factors are statistically significant, non-correlated investment factors that add alpha. So again, I think skepticism is healthy and if you get, uh, if you gain performance over a short period of time by being overweight, the right style and right sector, more power to you, but that does not show that ESG doesn't add value and the analysis over the longer term shows that it does. And I mean, I've always thought about ESG as a risk mitigator as well and not necessarily <clears throat> always looking at it as an alpha driver. Can you speak a little bit to that? I'm sure. And, and in a way, I think we're talking about two sides of, of the same coin because risk is return. Uh, and maybe you're thinking about mitigating downside risk. And certainly uh, in terms of the, the factors that we look at that we put under the ESG moniker are corporate behaviors uh, that tend to work over longer periods of time because companies that have, say, better diversity, that uh, are constantly working to reduce their carbon footprint, um, that pay attention to uh, the, uh, the impact of their waste stream, uh, you know, all of those things come back to those companies in terms of not having significant downside events. And so in that sense, there is that risk uh, mitigation side of it, if we think about risk as being a significant drawdown. And lastly, you've written a lot about how you cannot have the E and the G without the S. Can you elaborate a little bit on that for us? You know, I don't, I don't want to take a, a Mitt Romney of context, but corporations are people. And it's true that, um, you know, the, the environmental and governance externalities that emanate from corporations are created by decisions. And so the S part of the analysis, whether it's the diversity of the management team that can consider, um, you know, can take a 360 view of how 
they're managing the business, um, or again, the, the employees and how they're treated or the impacts on the community. Um, all of those factors then lead into um, how those corporations, uh, you know, how they decide on their governance structures and what impact they have on the environment, how they strive to um, to adapt and mitigate climate change, and so so it's it's sort of the the Adam and Eve of ESG factors actually starts with the S. And are you starting to see more companies being willing to disclose on data because of the pressure coming from COVID and George Floyd? Is this driving companies to be more transparent today? Um, I, I think it's coming. Uh, I, I'm not sure yet whether there's any consistency in reporting on things like diversity and impact so far has mostly come from consumers right. who have decided to use the power of the purse to, you know, to, to make purchasing decisions based on how companies are reacting to, you know, the current social justice or lack thereof uh, situation that we find ourselves in. And so, so investors are, you know, they, they follow on once we, we start having more and more reporting that comes as a result of the pressure of consumers right now. Ivka, I want to thank you so much for joining us at the Nest Summit today. Ivka is the Portfolio Manager of Prometheus, an international manager specializing in ESG and climate risk. Thank you so much for being at the Nest Summit. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really enjoyed it.
Thank you for coming back to the Nest Summit. Today, we're talking about innovations and advancements in climate-related scoring products. We're joined by Todd Bridges from Arabesque. Todd, welcome to the Nest Summit. Thank you, it's a pleasure to chat. So you've come out with a very innovative product that we've been tracking for a while called S-Ray and your heat-related scores related to S-Ray. Can you give the audience a little bit of a sense of what S-Ray is and how you're trying to adapt climate risk into the S-Ray data scores? Yeah, absolutely. So our, our recent advancements in new scoring systems is uh, the S-Ray temperature score. Uh, it really tries to crystallize and make sense of some of the key fundamental problems that many asset owners, asset managers, and corporations are trying to address and wrap their heads around, right? Many have, have heard about the Paris Agreement, the TCFD, or the IPPC, or the IEA scenario analysis, but those are really foreign, foreign outside objects, such as a policy or, you know, climate science scenario analysis. Uh, what we wanted to do is take an attempt at doing most of the heavy lifting, both on the data side and the research analytics side, to create a score that makes sense, that's allowing users to move into decision useful uh, strategic asset allocations, or for the case of the corporation, to make policies, internal policies that could really move the needle towards those big, huge uh, policy objectives or uh, climate science targets. And so the temperature score does that. It collects data uh, for thousands of global corporations uh, and captures their scope one, scope two, scope three, uh, creates a series of computational metrics such as the carbon intensity parameter. And then we project that into a series of scenario analysis by the IEA, for example, at 2030 and 2050. Uh, instantly, what the user gets or what the asset owner, asset manager or corporation gets is a series of outputs that they can feed into their investment process and hopefully make strategic alloc asset allocations to be aligned with the one degree or one and a half degree scenario, two degree, 2.5 or 2.7. Uh, we also have a three degree scenario where, whereby it, it is given predominantly to companies who don't even report on the climate data, or scope one, two or three. So again, it, it is our, it's a latest score that helps uh, users, in this case, uh, mostly institutional investors, um, start to make sense of big policies uh, and scenarios that are projected to be uh, and, and puts their the carbon emissions pathway into perspective. Todd, thank you for explaining that. Um, you know, the, the field, at least in the asset management and wealth management industry, has been trying to absorb ESG data for a while, and certainly SRA has been a thought leader on that data set. When you look at climate risk data, which is really separate and distinct from ESG data, do you think that there's more standardization around climate data and how do some of the recent frameworks that are coming out help in that process? Yeah, brilliant. As you know, and most of the veterans who are listening to this know, we've had a long struggle to try to gain kind of trust legitimacy by the, the core financial markets. Uh, what is ESG and capturing ESG data? That is a very complicated and messy subject. For environmental data, it's a little bit more cut and dry. Uh, and so it is, you know, a scope one, scope two, scope three parameter. Uh, what types of uh, embedded fossil fuel reserves do you have? Uh, so, you know, on an empirical side, it's it's a little bit easier to, to measure, which is great. Um, and again, uh, beyond just the data, you know, uniqueness of the environmental or climate data, uh, the regulations are, are much clearer on these parameters. And so the European Commission, uh, through the technical expert group and a series of new regulations that will be taking place throughout the European markets, uh, will put greater regularity on, uh, you know, classifying sustainable investing uh, and in, in particular environmental um, products. So, for example, the SFDR, uh, which is the new regulation that will be going into effect as of March of next year throughout the European Union, will clearly specify uh, approximately 50 indicators or metrics uh, most of them being around the environmental parameters that every asset manager in the European Union will have to report on or against within their investment portfolio. Uh, 
some of that new taxonomy by the European uh, Commission uh, is also clearly defining what would be a climate change mitigation or climate change adaptation, right? So in the future, when asset managers create new products, whether it's a fund of some structure, vehicle structure, or an ETF, they will need to make reference to climate change mitigation or climate change adaptation if that was the objective of the fund. Uh, so now again, with respect to taxonomy and also with respect to metrics, we are starting to get much greater regularity and standardization uh, and this will help the markets on products and then also on data. So Todd, moving along in that process, what are the integration objectives for climate risk analysis that you're doing with SRI? Yeah, wonderful. So we're working both internally on our own designs, but also with clients around the world to, to help them in their assessment of how to integrate climate data. Um, again, there are many reasons one would, or the, you know, the asset owner or asset manager in this case would want to integrate. Uh, of course, they are thinking about ways to decarbonize the portfolio such that if and when we start to move to a low energy, uh, low carbon or a green economy. Uh, will you be decarbonizing the appropriate uh, the portfolio appropriately? Uh, will you keep an eye on these transition risks that as we move to a low carbon based economy, it might take us five to 10 years. And so you'll want to slowly manage the risk that's associated with decarbonization and the transition pathways. Uh, you also want to keep an eye within the portfolio about potential physical risks such that they will be happening at a much greater regularity. Typhoons, droughts, uh, what part of the portfolios will be impacted by those. Um, and then some asset owners, some asset managers are already at a policy level trying to indicate that they want to be 1.5 or 2 degree scenario aligned at the portfolio, which again, it's an ambitious objective. Uh, but at the portfolio le level, there's a series of techniques that you can align your equity or fixed income portfolio with the 1.5 or 2 degree scenario. So there's a, there's a, lo a lot of reasons that uh, we have been uh, uh, integrating climate data. Uh, we're helping clients on their, on their pathway uh, and their, uh, these techniques, you know, I'd love to share with you as well. Please uh, give us some examples of the portfolio level techniques of the climate related investment strategies for our audience. Don't yeah, again, again, for you, I, I believe you probably know most of these, but uh, let me just um, articulate a few, for example, that if you were going to objective is to decarbonize the portfolio, one could very well implement that through a series of techniques such as a screening or, uh, you know, negative screening, if you will, in particular, or, de uh, you know, perhaps taking the fossil fuel out of the portfolio. Um, so you can very well do that with a heavy hand, right? So you can strip out all fossil fuels, or uh, it's probably best and more risk efficient and a better risk management technique to slowly start to pull out of these positions with a 10, 15, 20% decarbonization of the portfolio and slowly move all of your equity portfolios away from that over time. Um, there's, again, that's the negative screening, of course, we all know that. There's a lot more advancements being made with integration, right? Full ESG integration, or in this case, climate integration. Uh, this is where you would want to start playing with in the portfolio in the universe security selection uh, to either, again, manage the downside risk so that you start to decrease companies from the universe, but now also start to select the companies who are doing much better on a parameter, such as carbon intensity, a weighted uh, carbon intensity, for example. So now you're starting to make sure that those companies that are moving in the right direction, on still on a carbon parameter, if you will, are included, or you perhaps over sample on that parameter. Then of course, for those who are a little bit more, uh, I guess, have universal buy-in on, on the climate uh, and integration techniques, then you start reweighting some of the portfolio parameters, such as you, you take a beta uh, portfolio, 
uh, and start to place greater and greater weight on those companies that are moving into the low carbon economy or the green revenue sectors, if you will, and place greater weights on those in the ultimate portfolio that you're, you're designing. Um, there are, well, all of these techniques can be used in parallel with traditional financial integration techniques, right? Such that you would want to always keep track of as you're decarbonizing the portfolio, as you minimize the carbon, in, the carbon intensity, if you will, uh, you're also always keeping a, an eye on the risk parameter, right? That could be your standard deviation, your Sereno, uh, sharp ratio, a series of other parameters. So that you always want to make sure that your climate objectives, if you will, and the techniques you're using to achieve those climate objectives does not interfere with the traditional financial parameter that you want to ensure. So those are many, many techniques we can keep diving into, but at a high level and some particulars, that's the, those are the objectives and how to achieve it at the portfolio with certain techniques. Todd, thank you for that. Can you speak to the people that are out in the audience that, especially even advisors that have really been shunning even adopting ESG as a strategy for portfolio selection and now have to deal with a second layer of data um, around climate change and climate risk. Couldn't you just speak to them about why it's urgent and what you're seeing certainly at the institutional level versus what you're seeing in the just wealth management and advisor community? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of recommendations I always like to suggest is yeah. that, you know, we will see increasing regulation on these parameters, right? It, so it's no longer because we think that it's going to affect the better risk return profile. Um, you know, again, that is critical and very important for a certain audience, but those who are not perhaps convinced of that argument, uh, I do want to just make sure that we know that the regulations are coming, right? Throughout the European Union, they start to come in in 2021, and it's starting to come at an increasing rate. So on how you design products, on how you design indices, on how you report on these parameters across every financial entity, if you will, or financial advisor firm. Um, and that's just in the European Union. There's a series of new regulations coming online within the APAC region, China, uh, and of course the Canadian market uh, and regulators are, are making progress as well. The, year, the U.S. context uh, within the current administration perhaps is not going to be a most uh, a thought leader on the climate regulation parameter or ESG integration, but uh, you know it, it, these are these are things that one needs to be aware of. So the regulation is huge. Uh, I, I can't emphasize that we, we've kind of missed we've kind of missed that, and we've now reached a critical point where regulation will be coming at an increasing rate. Um, Within the financial sector, it's also important to point out, uh, you know, for those who understand the fiduciary duty and the fiduciary responsibility, uh, there's increasing awareness of this, that this may be one other parameter whereby you would want to take it into account on your traditional investment practices, right? Whether this is any rational investor wish to take in this new information called ESG or climate data, uh, there's a growing consensus that many asset owners, asset managers, uh, are believing this is within the fiduciary duty. Uh, and then final parameter is that, you know, I would say that the quality of data is getting much better. It's not perfect, but we're at a stage in 2020 and soon to be 2021 where the quality of that data is as or soon to be as uh, high quality as that of the financial markets, right? Uh, and so you can put greater trust into the data and integration techniques that you're designing and building. Todd, I want to thank you and Arabesque for joining us at the Nest Summit and for the great work that you're doing around climate risk. Thank you so much. Absolutely. My pleasure.
Hi, welcome back to the Javits Center. We're live at the Nest Summit, and I'm your host, Jeff Gitterman. Our session right now is municipal bond data and climate risk, and I'm joined by Andrew Terrace from Breckenridge, Chris Harshorn from Risk. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here. So Chris, um, as you know, I think I'm enamored with the data that your company puts out. Um, I, I think it's very illuminating to really understand that there are data companies that are really looking forward over the terms of a municipal bond to see what the issues are around climate risk and the factors. Can you tell me a little bit what is that analysis called and a little bit about how it works? Yeah, so the the overall solution is, uh, is called um, Risk um, Climate or Muni Climate Analytics. Uh, and the, the the goal of it and the, I guess, the use of it, as you will hear about from Andrew as well, is to provide um, issuer universe coverage all the way down to the QCIPs involving uh, the discloses the climate risk for any given issuer of any given maturity um, and not just squishy scorecard based metrics, but we actually get down into the, the gory detail of critical, I guess, health issues for an issuer, things like real estate at risk, um, population movement, uh, the populations at risk. So things that really underpin the, the health of a given municipal bond issuer. That's where we focus and we can do that with high levels of geospatial granularity. So when you started looking at climate risk, what made you start at the Arab municipal bonds? Yeah, well, Risk has uh, actually been around since 2016, so we're Boston headquartered. And I think for a couple of years, the company was looking across different asset classes and across um, different assets overall. So things like real estate or insurance or looking at corporations. And for a bunch of different reasons, um, they turned out to be not the best place for us. Um, insurance companies can change their premiums every year or they can just ultimately exit from a market in terms of climate risk. Uh, in the real estate space, a uh, given user can exit out of that real estate position um, in any given time frame that they, they feel like they want to. When you go and look at, at uh, municipal bond issuers, they are inextricably tied to patches of dirt that have asset value on them and there's no way for them to sell out of those positions. Um, their revenue lines are tied to those patches of dirt. Their cost lines are tied to those patches of dirt, which means ultimately when climate change um, impacts a patch of dirt, the, the one entity, the one group left holding that baby are the municipal bond issuers. There is nowhere for them to run. There is nowhere for them to hide. Uh, when we started talking to participants in, in the municipal bond space, uh, what we saw and heard was it was really poorly understood um, in terms of what the climate risks actually were to municipal bond issuers. A couple of reasons for that. Um, far too many reports have talked about the year 2100 in grandiose terms, which allows for the less nuanced thinkers to kick the can down the road and think they're okay. And then uh, the participants we talked to, uh, they looked at historical information. Um, and the limited number of defaults that have occurred because of climate events in the municipal bond sector. Um, to use a Gretzkyism, um, those people are not skating to where the puck is obviously going. They're using historicals that are badly out of context in terms of what we know climate change is going to do to the health municipal bond issues. And last but not least, there was no data availability. So when we saw the gap and when we saw the knowledge gap, uh, when we took a closer look, no one was actually providing um, coherent data that was covering the municipal bond sector. It is a complex sector to coverage, uh, to cover. Um, it has geospatial nuance that uh, not many are capable of providing it, uh, of providing. Um, so we really saw an opportunity where there was clearly a need uh, in the municipal bond sector. There were clearly users who could use this information and there was clearly no one providing that information. And that's just all fully aligned with the mission that Risk has had all along since it was founded in 2016. So Chris, when we're talking about the risk that you're assessing, I just wanna give people a sense of the depth and breadth of the kind of data because you're looking at extreme weather risk, you're looking at fire risk, you're looking at heat risk, floods and droughts, water scarcity issues, 
I mean, this is a plethora hmm. of data around each single QCIP that is available in the United States. I mean, that's a, an incredible universe. I think when people try to imagine it, they can't even have a sense of the depth of data that your company is now providing. And I'm wondering how that drives conversations today when you show a company or an issuer or an investor or an allocator the depth of data that you can provide them. Yeah, well, once um, I guess once the initial shock of um, how did you guys do this uh, wears off and we can actually start looking at the data as opposed to just the enormity of it, um, then it becomes um, a lot more focused on on how to use it, how to think about it, and that's where the questions really go and how the reactions really uh, really follow. So um, we're providing information that um, is not just present day climate, is also climate change conditioned. So we can show a, a, for a given issue in Florida or Texas and California what the risk is today, but we can also show what the risk is out to 2030 or 2032 or whatever the specific date is that uh, a given muni bond market participant wants to look at. So I guess it's, it's that initial shock and awe of the enormity of the data, as you say, and that's why it took us four years to really pull this thing together. And once we get beyond that point, though, it gets down to very specific questions saying, all right, compare this county to this county, this hospital system to this hospital system. Tell me what my threshold should be. Tell me what my risks are. Um, tell me how I should think about your data because I've never had access to it before. I've got to think an entirely different paradigm when it comes to your information versus any universe I've ever looked at. Um, and that's really the journey we're on with a lot of clients we work with is integrating and understanding the data in order to drive actionable decisions. I'm curious, Chris, because you're doing this data and I think most of the time you're meeting with allocators or investors. Are you starting to see any of this have an impact on actually issuance of municipal bonds in the marketplace or we're not there yet? We are not there yet, um, or at least we haven't seen any data um, to suggest that, uh, that we're there yet. Quite simply, there are, there are not enough uh, participants in the market who are appropriately informed to make appropriately informed decisions. So. Um, obviously, Andrew will um, talk from a, a Breckenridge perspective, and they've always been a, a thought leader in this space. Um, and we're at the start of that adoption curve. I think once there is an increasing mass, and ideally a critical mass, of participants, participants in the market seeing re and reacting to the same data, you are going to see splits. You are going to see some deltas. You are going to see climate risk actually priced in. Right now, the tools haven't existed, and the appetite to, to use those tools hasn't necessarily been there either. Um, we're on the precipice of that changing, given that the data is now available. And I can tell you the traction has been very good out in the market for those that are willing to get into this and will have an advantage in the market as a result. Chris, to me, it's almost like having inside information, although this is not illegal information, but it really is something that the market isn't pricing in or looking at. We know that's happening. We know the trends. We know the climate models. We know the science. And now we can actually use your data to price in risk. And it seems incredible to me that it's so narrow in the marketplace, but also a huge opportunity for early investors like Breckenridge. Before we turn over to Andrew at Breckenridge, last question for you. Just take us into the future a little bit, although I have to say you've brought us like a quantum leap into the present maybe on the data and risk that are aligned with the work that you're doing. But take us out a little bit to the future. What surprises are you seeing? What trends are you seeing coming out of this data? Yeah, a few things now we've gotten into it. Um, even in the present day, um, we're, we're challenging the premise that climate risk has not started to impact issuers. Uh, so we've built out correlations now showing that uh, flood risk uh, can be correlated to population loss, can be correlated to property value loss, you know, things that very much underpin the, the health of an issuer. Um, we've observed the paucity and I would say the, the abject lack of climate change and climate risk disclosure by issuers. So I think that's going to be changing in the near future. The quality of disclosure is going to have to improve. Now the quality of data is there to shine a light on it. And then beyond that, I think as climate change continues, and let's face it, we're, we're locked in for the next 10 years um, in terms of where the climate is going. There's not a lot we can do about it. I think over the next 10 years, you are going to see 
um, that um, that split and that bifurcation on you know climate risk, who's at risk, who isn't, and what's what's the climate risk deficit that's going to have to be paid by issuers or by participants in the market that, that aren't aware of their risks. Chris, thank you so much for giving us insight into the great work that Risk is doing. In order to make it applicable to our audience members, I want to bring in Andrew Terrace from Breckenridge. Andrew, thank you so much for joining the Climate Summit. Thanks for having me. So, Andrew, what was the decision point for Breckenridge to start incorporating this data into their risk analysis, and what have you learned from it so far? Yeah, so um, so just just off the bat, real quick. So Breckenridge, we're an investment advisor. We specialize in uh, investment grade fixed income portfolio management. Um, we are uh, very much uh, big on the integration of uh, ESG into the, in the uh, within. We're a leader within the fixed income space, and so um, as part of that, um, you know, we're very much. Uh, believers that climate change is a, you know, as a material investment risk is something uh, significant that we need to pay a uh, very uh, significant amount of attention to. Um, and as far as the municipal bond market, you know, as sort of Chris was saying, we totally agree. Um, you know, m- municipal bond issuers are on the front lines for this risk, right? The first tremors from, um, from climate risk are going to be felt in the market. Um, and, um, you know, th- these are stationary issuers, right? They can't up and move, So, as, as Chris was saying. So, um, you know, we, the, the problem that we faced and why we wanted to sort of start incorporating um, sort of quantitative geospatial measures of, of climate risk into our investment process um, was uh, we, we, you know, we were issue, we're, we're not experts, right? We're not experts in geospatial analysis. We're not experts in, in climate science. Just we're bond managers. Um, and we just didn't have the expertise in-house to be able to know um, when we're looking at various, like a city, like the city, how do I know what the city of Boston looks like vis-a-vis the city of Los Angeles or so the city of Miami? How do they stack up in terms of their exposure from a climate perspective? And so, um, the other challenge we have is that we, you know, we're a bit, we're, you know, we're a big bond manager. We have over 40 billion in assets under management and, uh, we're investing in, uh, all 50, in terms of our municipal investments, we invest in all 50 states. We have thousands of municipal holdings and we needed, we needed something that was scalable, right? Um, that would be able to, that we could immediately sort of use as a comparison, um, and know where everything stacks up. Um, and so, um, th- that's sort of where the, the risk, um, uh, data comes in. Um, it's at the QCIP level, and we can immediately get a quick read on where everything stacks up. And we use that sort of that component um, as one element of uh, an overall internal risk evaluation that we're doing. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking at traditional risk factors, like if we're looking at the city of Boston, for example, how much cash does the city of Boston have in the bank? Um, or, you know, what's the aggregate value of the property? What's the taxing capacity of the city of Boston to pay to pay us back? Um, then you know, we're layering on so some of these sheer physical climate risk factors. Um, and so that package together is packaged into uh, an overall uh, information uh, package that our traders and portfolio managers use in the pricing and security selection process. When people think about climate risk, unfortunately, because of the way scientists have communicated it, they think about a 2150 or a 2100 problem. So I could see now in this time why people are starting to look at long-term bond issuance and the risks that they have. But what about short-term bondholders? Why should short-term bondholders, three to five-year maturities, really care about climate risk presently? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I think there's a couple a couple things to think about. The, the first thing would be, well, I mean, these risks are, as Chris sort of was, was getting into, these risks are materializing today. I mean, look at the fires and extreme heat in California that's going on right now. Look at the, the increasing frequency and severity with which hurricanes are hitting Florida and the Gulf Coast, right? So these are, these are, these are 2020 problems. Um, and if you think about um, you know, what, what borrowers, municipal bond borrowers would be most at risk today would be, um, if you think about climate risk, it, it's essentially, essentially the way we view it is as a threat multiplier or an accelerant, right? So it, it, uh, in the sense that it can, uh, it can, you know, current climate events can magnify existing credit weaknesses of a, of a borrower, right? So you have, you have a, 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 an issuer today who's, who's exhibiting a baseline level of distress already, right? Think like a Puerto Rico or someone like that. 
um, and then you layer on top of it this this risk of climate change, which is very real today. That that can be a toxic brew of problems that that can create um, repayment risk. Um, we think in the near term, you know, not not just the the medium or long term. And the other the other issue is, you know, in terms of like um, you know thinking this is a far off problem is well. Um, well, we don't know when that tipping point is, right? We, we don't think of climate climate risk or climate change as a linear, gradual, slow, predictable problem, right? It, this is this is much more likely going to be like a gradual and then sudden type event, right? And so, um, you know, in certain areas, things could happen. You know, things things could develop a lot faster than you're expecting. Right, so if you think about a coastal community down in, in the on the Atlantic seaboard, right, it's exposed to sea level rise and coastal flooding. Um, well, all of a sudden, you know, you could have a problem if if the residents are picking up and and you know they're they're saying we don't want to live here anymore. Like the, let's say the insurers pull out, property insurers pull out, and you have this this exodus of people, um, and that creates sort of a snowball effect. Well, that that again, that's not something that's supposed to, that they that could easily be this this predictable gradual process it could be something very sudden and so if you're not if you're not getting a handle on climate risk today um you could be way behind the eight ball before you know it so andrew just to bring this home for the average investor talk to us about what value at risk is and how you use that measurement to compare let's say a new york state bond to a florida bond yeah, so when we're thinking about sort of like how we how we connect this, um, you know, how we connect climate risk or how we how we use the data in terms of like what its impact is on, um, you know, some of the some of the core and fundamental sort of uh, data points around climate risk that we would think about. Um, there's a few that come to mind. I mean, the first is sort of a core thing that we've already talked about is is uh, property values, right? So or tax base. What's the tax taxing capacity of this? Uh, community in terms of its ability to repay its debt. You know, what is, if I think about a place in, in Florida, right, that has high climate risk, what is the, what is the proper, what is the impact and the speed with which property values could be affected in terms of, of the ability uh, of, of the borrower to repay its debt? Um, you know, the, another thing is migration, right? So population, population outflows or population loss this is an, a, a leading indicator for for credit stress and this is this is sort of a traditional thing that's been in the medium market for a long time is that po the loss of population is is a is a red flag warning for uh, for credit risk and for for stress you think about the city of Detroit which went bankrupt in 2013. Um, one of their 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 two big problems really were, were population loss and and the the shrinking of their tax base right and that that basically uh, inhibited them for a long time until they they went bankrupt and so um, if these if these places that have high climate risk um, you know they they start exhibiting these these sort of core fundamental credit stress risks and you can connect those two then you can sort of see clearly where your value at risk uh, sort of lies the third sort of um, component that, that we think about is sort of the, the impact on debt or leverage right um, you know obviously the higher the higher leverage you have the more risk you potentially could 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 have um, in terms of your ability to your capacity to pay back so we think about mm. when we're looking at when we're looking at places that have high climate risk um, it's what what is the ability of that of that borrower to repay to sorry what is the ability of that borrower to fund infrastructure adaptation projects or you know what what is its ability to fund infrastructure to mitigate some of the some of the Project, some, some of the risks that they have. So you think about, you know, a, a borrower, the Florida Keys, right? What is the cost? Is it cost prohibitive to raise roads? How much is that going to cost? And if so, um, you know, can they can a, can the issuer borrow borrow enough to to um, at an affordable rate to to uh, make sure they can pay their investors back? So those are kind of three things that we examples of things that we think about. I want to thank Chris Hartshorn from Risk and Andrew Terrace from Breckenridge for joining us for a deep dive into understanding the risks that municipal bond issuers are facing and those investors that are buying those municipal bonds <clears throat> around the climate change issues that this world is facing. You were joining me live at the Jacob Javits Center for the Nest Summit. Thank you.